Thanks. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I would first like to join all the other speakers in thanking all the organizers for hosting such a wonderful conference here uh, in such a beautiful place. So today I'm going to talk about quantum entanglement in holography. So what is quantum entanglement? Quantum entanglement is basically correlations between different parts of a full quantum system uh, in a particular state. So if you do a Google search of quantum entanglement, you might find the simplest example, uh, which is uh, a state, an entangled pair of uh, two spins in such a state, usually called the EPR state. Uh, it's the simplest example of an entangled state. Uh, and you might find a picture like this. But um, this really doesn't do justice to how complicated entanglement is in general. The general picture should usually look like something this. So um, uh, the, in the general quantum system with many degrees of freedom, we usually have many ways of having entanglement between different parts of the system. So the multi-partite structure of entanglement is very complicated. Um, so I want to mention a few things. Entanglement is not just entanglement entropy. Uh, rather, I would like to think about it as the structure of the many-body quantum state. Um, and entanglement entropy, uh, or Van Neumann entropy, is just one of many probes of how the structure of entanglement appears in a particular state. Um, there are many other probes. Uh, we can use correlation functions. Um, certainly, they tell us something about the correlators, correlation uh, between different parts of the system. We can use Rennie entropy, different set of entropies. Uh, we can use modular Hamiltonians, modular flows, uh, complexity, or even quantum error correction. So I'll mention these concepts as different ways of probing quantum entanglement in later parts of the talk. And we'll introduce all these ideas gradually. Um, as we have seen um, in recent years, more and more um, studying the structure of entanglement has played an increasingly bigger and bigger role in understanding many body physics. This is true um, in many, across many fields, uh, including condensed matter physics. Um, I'd like to think of string theory and quantum field theory simply as special many body systems. So um, uh, with many special symmetries and so on. But nonetheless, there are many body systems and we should be able to use uh, quantum entanglement as a probe to study the proper the system. So the strategy is we should follow the patterns of entanglement and to address interesting questions that we'd like to answer, including questions such as how does quantum gravity work? How do we describe the black hole interior? Is there an uh, interior or not? How do we describe cosmology in a complete quantum mechanical framework? So these are the questions that I'd like you to keep in mind while we do more detailed study of quantum entanglement in various systems, including quantum field theory and holography. So the plan for my talk is, for the rest of the talk, is basically to follow this uh, list of items. Uh, I'll first talk about the entanglement in quantum field theory. Um, quantum field theory is the basic thing that we use and holography is a statement about the duel between specific quantum field theories and quantum gravity. So it's good to start with quantum field theory. And then we will talk about entanglement in holography. We will um, give out a few um, applications and generalizations of uh, the um, specific things that we learn about holographic entanglement. And finally, I'll mention um, quantum holographic error correction, a way of thinking about holographic duality as a quantum error correcting code, and where does that lead us? So let's start with entanglement in quantum field theory. Um, so first, some basic definitions. Uh, for any quantum system where we can divide the system into two parts, A and A bar, in quantum field theory, we do this division usually 
uh, using spatial regions, A and A bar, uh, we can define a Van Neumann entropy for region A by using the reduced density matrix on A after tracing out the complement. Um, it is defined in this way as minus trace row log row. There is a generalization of the Van Neumann entropy called the Rainy entropy uh, that comes with uh, one parameter, N, uh, and it goes to the Van Neumann entropy as N goes to one. This is often a useful way of computing the Van Neumann entropy. But I want to mention that also these quantities have a much rich set of information about the spectrum of the density matrix. So they are themselves also quite interesting. Studying this is uh, interesting in quantum field theory and holography, as we will see. First, the most immediate uh, result uh, about the Van Neumann entropy is that if we choose a spatial region, A, uh, with a boundary, the boundary is usually called the entangling surface, then there is an area law divergence in the Van Neumann entropy. Uh, the area law divergence is simply a statement that in quantum field theory, there are very short distance modes at arbitrarily short distance, and they are very correlated with each other across the entangling surface. So the, um, con their contribution to the entanglement entropy is, goes like the area divided by the short distance cutoff epsilon to some power that depends on the dimension. There are subleading terms hidden in these dots. Uh, the power decreases, the power divergence decreases by two as you go to the, from one term to the next term. And eventually there is a universal term here uh, with all, uh, with, uh, where this, uh, with, with all the other terms here um, now in so the other terms here are not universal in the sense that the, for example, the coefficient here that I didn't write down um, is generally a function of the regularization scheme, but the universal term does not depend on the particular scheme, scheme that we use to compute the Van Neumann entropy. Just to be concrete, um, we have two cases, when d is even or when d is odd. If the dimension of the space-time is even, then the universal term is logarithmically divergent uh, as log epsilon with a coefficient that is generally a superposition of conformal invariants that we can construct on the entangling surface. As a very concrete example, if we consider four-dimensional conformal field theory, then uh, the coefficient is uh, a sum of three terms with coefficients determined by the central charge a and c of the theory, and the first term is basically the integral a times the integral of the uh, induced Ricci scalar on the entangling surface. The second term is an extrinsic curvature term, which is, can be schematically written as k squared. And the third term is a particular contraction of the vial tensor integrated on the surface. So those are the three conformal invariants that we can construct in, in such dimensions. In our dimension, um, the universal term here is finite and non-local, so it doesn't depend on the cutoff. Um, uh, in a very special case where we have a CFT and the region A is a spherical disk in the space of the CFT, uh, then the universal term is related to the free energy on the sphere of the CFT, usually called F. So all of this can be generalized to the Rainy entropy. Um, the coefficients here generalizes to uh, functions of the Rainy parameter n. Um, and they are less, less studied, more complicated, not just given by the central charges, uh, but, but the structure of the divergence doesn't change much. Um, also, it has been studied uh, for many cases uh, where uh, we have corners in the uh, entangling surface. So here we have a very smooth entangling surface. If the entangling surface has corners of various co-dimension, then we can have more divergences in the Van Neumann and Rainy entropies. And again, in those cases, the extra divergences are characterized by invariants on the singularities of the entangling surface. So 
the Vinoy entropy satisfies a very strong, uh, very important condition called strong subadditivity. Uh, it's basically the statement that in any system with three non overlapping subsystems, A, B, and C, um, SAB plus SBC should be always greater than or equal to SABC plus SB. So I made a typo over there. In the Lorentz invariant quantum field theory, um, this strong subadditivity is very powerful and can lead to monotonic C functions in two dimensions and monotonic F functions in three dimensions. Um, furthermore, it leads to the A theorem in four dimensions, as recently shown, uh, that says between the two fixed points you know, uh, at the ends of the RG flow, um, uh, the UV fixed point should have uh, a central charge that is always greater than or equal to the, um, the A value, the A central charge in the infrared. So the basic idea uh, of this, uh, let me tell you the basic idea in two dimensions. The other dim higher dimensional case are similar with some subtleties. Um, so in two dimensions, we're talking about intervals. Um, and we choose to use strong subadditivity with A, B, C, being three intervals denoted by x, y, and z here. And it should be understood that we are doing, we are doing things uh, on the light cone, so x, so x and z are light-like intervals. Um, um, and if we apply this uh, strong subadditivity to this setup, um, we will find a second derivative condition for the uh, Van Neumann entropy S of L, where S of L is defined simply as the Van Neumann entropy for an interval of length of invariant length L. This quantity should not depend it should not depend on the boost. So that's why we can use the boost to um, we can use Lorentz invariance to reduce this setup to a statement about the particular second derivative of S of L. Um, it's that the statement is that the second derivative is always non-positive. And it turns out we can define a C function using the first derivative, and then it says the, sec the first derivative of that C function is uh, monotonic. The derivative of that function is uh, always non-positive. So this is the C theorem in two dimensions. So um, the next idea, the next concept is the uh, concept of the modular Hamiltonian. The modular Hamiltonian is simply defined for any density matrix as minus log rho. Um, this is a very simple definition. Uh, what it does is it makes the state look very thermal. Um, so this is always the Hamiltonian that the state would be thermal with respect to. Uh, the penalty to pay is that this thing is in general non-local uh, for a generic state. Um, it means that it cannot be written as an integral of local operators in the theory, in general. There are, two, there are several exceptions uh, where it is local, despite the generic case. First case is, of course, when the state is already thermal with respect to a local Hamiltonian. And then, of course, the modular Hamiltonian is, uh, is basically h plus a constant. Uh, if h is local, then the modular Hamiltonian is local. The second important case is when the, uh, we are considering a half space in the vacuum state of a quantum field theory. In this case, the, um, uh, the state is thermal with respect to the, module, uh, with respect to the boost. So um, the modular Hamiltonian up to a constant, which I'm dropping here, is written as an integral of z, the coordinate um, uh, orthogonal to the boundary of the half space, times the stress tensor. So this is a general statement in a Lorentz invariant quantum field theory. The third exception, where the modular Hamiltonian is local, um, is when we consider a spherical disk region in the CFT vacuum. Um, this case is basically related to the previous case of half space in quantum field theory by a conformal transformation. So you can conformal transform the disk into half space and use the previous result. In this case, the conformal transformation gives the, um, gives the, uh, the, um, the modular Hamiltonian as a particular, uh, again, a particular integral of the stress tensor with some decorations here. Um, 
So it turns out that the, the, the two exceptions, the last two exceptions I've mentioned, the half space case in the, in the vacuum of a quantum field theory, and here the disk region in, uh, in, a conform, in a CFT vacuum, can both be generalized to weakly cases where in the, trans, in the parallel direction to the boundary of the, uh, to, in parallel direction of the entangling surface, uh, we don't have to have a strict, um, um, uh, strict planes or strict um, uh, spheres. So in these cases, there is a certain sense that the, um, that the modular Hamiltonian can still be written as a, as a local quantity on the light cone. And the reason we're talking about modular Hamiltonian is, is they, you sh they, they have since provided a very useful uh, set of tools for studying various things about quantum field theory. Uh, in particular, the, um, the variation of modular Hamiltonians under shape deformations have been studied quite extensively. And uh, the basic idea is if you do shape deformations of the modular Hamiltonian, they are controlled by properties of the stress tensor of the theory. And um, uh, if we use extra conditions, quantum information theoretic conditions motivated by uh, the modular Hamiltonian, then we can get very um, non-trivial conditions on um, quantum field theory. One of uh, the examples is the average non-energy condition, which says the integral of T plus plus on, um, on the light direction is always non-negative in any state of the, of the quantum field theory. So um, the proof of this uses both, uh, essentially uses the uh, monotonicity of the relative entropy, uh, which is uh, equivalent to strong subadditivity that I introduced earlier, uh, but is stated in a different form. And when we study the shape deformation of the relative entropy, uh, one can find this um, average non-energy condition. So, and just want to uh, mention that the usual non-energy condition that we um, that we say, uh, where we say that the T plus plus is uh, non-negative is generally not true in quantum mechanically, but this is true uh, in an exact quantum mechanical sense. Uh, I didn't define relative entropy, so let me do it now. Um, the relative entropy is a quantity that you can define uh, on two states, rho and sigma. It's defined simply as trace of rho log rho minus trace of rho log sigma. So another way of understanding this is it's the difference between the expectation value of the modular Hamiltonian of sigma in the row state minus the um, Van Neumann entropy for the row state. So it's basically an energy minus the entropy in some appropriate sense. Um, good, quantity, good property of the relative entropy is that it is always non-negative. And it is only zero if, uh, if, if and only if the two states are the same. So this is why the relative entropy is usually thought of as a measure of dist distinguishability between the two states. It helps us to see how, how different the two states are. Um, it's not a distance, by the way. It's just a dis measure of dist distinguishability. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it satisfies a uh, useful property, a uh, monotonicity of the relative entropy. It basically says if I have two states on the larger system, let's say AB, that contains A, and if we trace out B, uh, the, the two new states that I get on A will be less distinguishable than in the, in the previous case. This makes a lot of sense. Um, if you can measure less observables, then you should be able to distinguish less well in any two states. But to exactly prove this is not easy and is equivalent to prove the um, complicated strong subadditivity. Uh, another non-trivial example of uh, deriving something um, about quantum field theory using these techniques is the quantum non-energy condition. It's a statement that it's basically a local version of the previous um, average uh, non-energy condition, here we have uh, T plus plus at the point in some state, 
and the statement is that it's not always uh, so. Uh, the difference between this and the classical non-energy condition is that we have some non-trivial right-hand side, and it turns out the right thing to put in there is a second derivative of the Van Neumann entropy of one side of uh, of this uh, point. So there is a precise definition of the second derivative to make this true as a quantum statement for any state at any point in space-time. And this uh, proof of this uses causality in, and uses um, the modular flow and so on. So um, the next part is I will introduce the entanglement uh, properties in holography. And uh, let me start with something that um, probably a lot of you have seen. This is the Rutakanagi formula that gives the Van Neumann entropy for a spatial region A in the holographic context. Um, so um, the, the statement is that the Van Neumann entropy is always given by the area of a minimal surface in the bulk. Um, there are two pictures that I like to draw. One is just looking at this particular time slice of ADS-CFT. Um, in this case, we have uh, a region A and its complement, and the Van Neumann entropy for A is simply given by the area of a, a, extreme also a minimal surface, in this case, uh, homologous to the a region A in the boundary. Homologous just means that there exists some surface in the middle whose boundary is the union of A and the RT surface. Um, one can also uh, add a time direction here and um, here uh, and say the same thing. Here A is the boundary region and the geodesic here is the RT surface. Uh, I want to just quickly mention two things about this formula. It's very practically useful for understanding entanglement in strongly coupled systems uh, and indeed has been applied for to many contexts in, uh, in holography, not just ADS-CFT, but more general space-times, perhaps. Um, and also, it is very conceptually important for understanding the emergence of space-time and gravity from entanglement. It's a very concrete connection between the structure of entanglement and the space-time geometry in the bulk. Um, this this Utakanagi formula can be derived or proved under uh, minor assumptions from ADS-CFT. And I just want to give you a basic idea of how this works. Um, I won't go into too much details, but in terms of words, the basic idea is that we use the replica trick to compute the reigning entropy. Instead of computing the Van Neumann entropy, we do the reigning entropy uh, for integer n. Um, and this basically gives, uh, this is given by the partition function of the theory on the replicated manifold, we use ADS-CFT to find the right bulk solution to compute that partition function. So this is fairly standard. Um, it turns out there is a trick we can do in the bulk so that the answer is given by the action of a bulk solution that has a conical deficit, a conical defect with a deficit angle that determ is determined by the little m parameter. So I call this bulk solution Bn. Um, and the Van Neumann entropy can be calculated by the derivative of the on shell action with respect to n uh, at n equals 1. So the point here is that the, after we use uh, the prescription on the second line uh, using the bulk solution with a conical defect, we can now analytically continue to arbitrary n and it's no longer required to be an integer. The, uh, so then, um, the basic idea is the minimal surface that we should get in the RT prescription is simply a relic of the conical defect when the conical deficit angle goes to zero. And the conical deficit angle does, goes to does go to zero as n goes to one. And finally, we need to get the area. So to get the area, we simply do this variation of the on-shell action, and it, because it's on-shell, it's only a boundary term, the boundary term happens to be the area. So that completes what the proof from ADS-CFT. Now, uh, RT was originally proposed in the uh, static case, and, clear, and if you think about it, 
uh, slightly more, you'll find that it is true whenever, the, whenever it is applied at the moment of time reflection symmetry. Um, but this is not the most general case. So the most general case, we have a time-dependent state. We uh, then need to use this covariant generalization of RT. Um, so usually we call it HRT, where uh, we simply replace the minimal surface with an extremal surface in the space-time. This is a powerful tool for studying time-dependent physics, such as quantum quenches. And there are many things that has been done since using uh, this prescription. Um, I should mention that it can also be derived using ADS-CFT, using a variant of the argument that I presented on the previous slide. So um, the RT formula is, should be thought of as the leading order result for the Vinoyan entropy in a double expansion. The double expansion means an expansion in both um, the higher derivative coupling and an expansion in the quantum, um, in G Newton, in quantum, in quantum corrections. So we have since understood the corrections to uh, the leading order result in both of these expansions. And I will talk about uh, these two um, in the same order. Uh, so first, let's talk about higher derivative corrections. Um, these are also known as alpha prime corrections in a string theory context, um, where the action of the theory is given not just by the Einstein-Hubert action, but also with higher derivative terms, including um, higher polynomials in the Riemann tensor and their derivatives. In general, um, what happens in this case is uh, very simple. We should replace the area in the RT prescription by some generalized notion of the area. So the generalized area, uh, well, it has a definition. It simply goes through the previous um, um, argument using the conical deficit geometry, and you simply define it in the appropriate higher derivative theory uh, using the, the, uh, the right action as the derivative of the Anshell action in that, in that, in that setup. Um, in specific cases, you can compute it, and in, generally, uh, in general, the result has a form of uh, the Ward entropy uh, that is usually defined for a particular higher derivative theory, plus certain corrections that involves at least two powers of the extrinsic curvature tensor. Um, um, one basic way of understanding why we have two kinds of corrections two kinds of terms, is because when we take the derivative, um, well, the action is the integral of a local quantity. So we might be tempted to just take the derivative inside on the integrand um, before we do the integral. Well, that will give the Ward entropy, but it won't give the extra term uh, unless we discover that um, if we do this, we actually find extra divergences which are cured by, um, which are, which are cured by doing a careful analysis near n equals one. And those terms always involve extrinsic curvatures. So a specific example of that is if we have a theory that includes, uh, let's say, the Einstein-Hilbert action and also R mu nu, R mu nu with some coupling, then the generalized area is simply the normal area plus uh, this correction where the first term is simply the Ward entropy, it's the Ricci, uh, Ricci tensor uh, contracted uh, in some directions, and the second term is the extrinsic curvature term that involves k squared. Um, all of this applies to also dynamical black holes um, with dynamical horizons, so it's sort of a generalization of the water entropy in the dynamical case. And it's been shown that this is precisely the right pre prescription to obey the second law. The coefficient here, including both terms, needs to be exactly these coefficients in order for the second law to hold. So let me go to the quantum corrections. The quantum corrections is the second expansion that we can do in, uh, the, in the bulk, uh, where we expand in uh, G Newton. Uh, in the, in the ADS-CFT context, this is the same as the expansion in 1 over n, 
And, um, and this comes from contributions. So these quantum corrections comes from contributions from matter fields and gravitons in the bulk. The prescription for these quantum corrections turned out to be extremely simple. Um, it turns out that we can simply add the, um, the area term, first promote the area term to an expectation value. This is what, what we usually do when we compute quantum corrections. We actually have an area operator. We calculate the expectation value in the bulk state. And then uh, we also add it to um, a term which is the bulk entropy, and we extremize the sum. This defines a um, quantum version of the extremal surface known as the quantum extremal surface. And um, this is true, this is valid. This is a very compact formula that um, includes all the corrections, all order corrections in G Newton. Of course, uh, in order to use this formula, you have to calculate the expectation value of A and the bulk entropy to all orders in to high and higher orders in G Newton in order to actually use this. But the fact that such a formula exists is quite surprising. Um, it's also a quite natural thing to have the, this form for the, for the correction, because um, if we do an RG flow in the bulk, then there will be certain norm renormalizations to Newton's constant and, and other high derivative couplings. And these. Um, these uh, renormalizations correspond to precisely divergences in the bulk entropy, so that the sum of these two terms are actually invariant under the RG flow. So it's a well-defined quantity, even from just the bulk effective field theory perspective. And if you do it without the right combination, you won't find the same thing. Um, and finally, um, this is an improvement of um, the previous result um, discovered by Faulkner, Lukerts, and Manasena, where they derived a one-loop version of this. The one-loop version is basically you uh, simply use the classical extremal surface as opposed to the quantum extremal surface. So you drop the extremum here where you evaluate this on the classical RT surface. I should mention that the bulk entropy is defined in the bulk region known as the entanglement wedge. Um, this is simply the domain of dependence of this uh, blue region uh, for a boundary region A. And this blue region is simply an equinal surface uh, between A and gamma A, where gamma A is the extremal surface. So this is the definition of the entanglement. Again, this formula can be derived um, using various tools from ads CFT. I won't go through any of this, but I want to give a simple example where I hope to convince you that this is not crazy. Um, if you consider 2D dilaton gravity with a lot of matter fields, um, then this is, uh, this, is, um, this is basically a uh, model based on um, CGHS dilaton theory and uh, um, improvement, improvement by RST. Um, so the quantum correction in this case can be computed, uh, and it generates a non-local effective action for the, for the theory. Um, the non-local term is uh, shown on the, on the second term. The good thing about this, well, in general, this is going to be complicated, but the easy thing about this case is that you can go to the conformal gauge and make it appear uh, local again and do the usual calculation of the entropy in that gauge. And then um, you, can compare the, uh, the, uh, you can compare the results computed um, um, on both sides and find that quantum extrem extremality is precisely what you get in this situation. So, um, I want to also mention a, a generalization of the RT formula to the Rainy entropy. So this is the holographic Rainy entropy. Um, the Rainy entropy, as we said before, is defined in this way. And um, uh, the, the result that I'm going to say is basically that a particular derivative of the Rainy entropy is given by the area of cosmic brains instead of, cosmic, uh, instead of minimal surfaces. Um, 
So what are the co those cosmic brains? They are very similar to minimal surfaces. They are both co-dimension two, and they are both homologous to the region under consideration, region A. But the cosmic brain is different in the sense that they have non-zero tension, and the tension is given as a function of n in this way. Uh, what it does is that the brain will back react on the geometry and create a conical deficit. This is exactly the same conical deficit as we saw before in the derivation of the RT formula. The only thing that we do now is we don't do the final step of taking n to 1 at the end of the day. So we, uh, so we discover a statement about the Rainy entropy rather than the Van Neumann entropy. So a useful way of getting the geometry is simply to say I'm going to uh, phenomenologically add a brain action to the bulk action and solve everything with that total action. Um, this is all classical, by the way. Um, this is supposed to work at leading order in, uh, in, the, in the 1 over n expansion. Um, and um, consistency check is as n goes to 1, uh, the, probe brain should, the, the brain should become a probe brain because the tension goes to 0, so it settles at the minimal surface and it agrees with the Takanagi formula. So this is, can be thought of as a one-parameter generalization of the RT formula. Um, just a little bit intuition about why does this work. Um, well, because the left-hand side is a more general, nat more natural candidate for, uh, for generalizing the Van Neumann entropy than the Rainy entropy in some sense. Uh, Rainy entropy is defined as um, um, in terms of the trace of rho to the n. So in some sense, it's more like a partition function, whereas S and tilde defined using this derivative is more like um, uh, um, is more like uh, ent thermodynamic, thermodynamic entropy. In fact, one can make this precise by writing the definition of uh, this uh, derivative, which I've called S and tilde here, as um, in terms of the standard thermodynamic relation with some definition of the free energy. And you can see the free energy is basically up to some overall constant on uh, the Rainy entropy, the standard Rainy entropy, and the temperature is 1 over n. So what this amounts to is really that you should think about this S tilde as a thermodynamic entropy with temperature 1 over n and with the modular Hamiltonian as your Hamiltonian. Um, of course, uh, this, uh, this being an entropy, it needs to be non-negative. So very easy consistency check is that um, the area is non-negative, so you automatically satisfy this. Um, and finally, um, an important consequence of this um, uh, understanding of holographic entanglement is um, uh, essentially two relations derived by um, Jeffries, Lucas, Monacena, and Sue. Um, called the JLMS relations. The first one is a statement about the modular Hamiltonian. So it's, in some sense, it's an improved version of the um, quantum corrected Rutakyanagi formula because if you plug this into the state, you will recover the Rutakyanagi formula. And this is an operator statement. It says the modular Hamiltonian on the boundary in the CFT is equal to some area operator divided by 4G plus the bulk modular Hamiltonian. Uh, again, the bulk modular Hamiltonian is defined in the entanglement wedge. Um, so um, at some level, this is saying that the modular flow uh, that you induce using the modular Hamiltonian should match between the CFT side and the bulk side. The second relation is that if you choose two states, rho and sigma, their relative entropy, we introduced relative entropy before, the relative entropy now can be computed in both the, in the CFT and in the bulk. And the statement is that they are equal. This is the same, same statement as saying that the two states are as indistinguishable indistingu in the CFT as in the bulk. So you don't lose anything by studying the two states, the difference of the two states in the bulk. Both of these relations hold to one loop order in 1 over n. So let's go to applications and generalizations of the things we've said so far, of course, there are a lot of um, um, recent progress in using all of this and applications and so on. So I won't cover all of them. I'll only cover some of them in this limited time. Um, but the first 
immediate thing that we get once we uh, use the RT formula is that there are different phases of holographic entanglement entropy as we vary the shape and size of the boundary region. This is an easy example illustrating how the minimal surface can transition from a disconnected phase to a connected phase as you change the size of the two intervals. Um, it's a first order phase transition similar to Hawking page. And um, um, you can think of the mutual information as the order parameter. The mutual information is defined in this way. It is zero in the first phase and non-zero in the second phase. Um, so uh, at large n, um, uh, which is um, to leading order in one over n, this mutual information, oh, sorry, to leading order in one over g, uh, this mutual information changes from zero to non-zero. The holographic rainy HP also have similar transitions. Um, but if you study them further, you find they have also uh, other transitions. So the phases of holographic rainy entropy is um, more rich. Uh, we can actually have, uh, in addition to the first order phase transitions we've said so far, there are additionally second order phase transitions as a function of n. So when n is greater than, greater than some critical value, you can go to a different phase. This, in order for this to happen, you, you need to have a sufficiently light bulb field. Um, so what the idea is that uh, if we increase n, this is similar to decrease the temperature. Remember, T, the temperature, in some sense, the temperature conjugate to the modular Hamiltonian is like 1 over n. Um, and as you decrease the temperature, the bulk field can condense. So two examples. One is if you have a spherical disk region, uh, in the on the boundary of this on the uh, in the boundary CFT, then this can be made exact because in this case it is given the rainy entropy is really given by the um, uh, thermodynamic entropy in a hyperbolic black hole background, and when you have a sufficiently light scalar field, the scalar field can be shown to condense. A second uh, class of examples is if you are in two boundary dimensions, uh, it's, uh, longer, so it's no longer sufficient to consider uh, single intervals, but you, if you consider multi-intervals, this kind of phase transitions generically occur with a sufficiently light scalar field. So um, this is also can be thought of as a statement about pure 3D gravity. Uh, they have interesting second order phase transitions uh, on a higher genus, genus Riemann surface. Um, Another thing that you get on, uh, after applying the RT formula is that you find interesting entropy inequalities. The, um, so first, we see that it's very easy to reproduce the strong subadditivity inequality holographically, despite the many-page proof of it using general, in general quantum systems. So this is a very easy, uh, essentially, relaxation proof of minimal surfaces using uh, using the RT formula. And similar uh, statements can be derived using the same technique, one of which is the monogamy of mutual information. And um, you can, if you increase the size the number of parties, um, for example, to five, you find additional inequalities like this one and, man, and many others. So all these inequalities define the so-called holographic entropy cone. Um, um, it's good to understand these cones. They are very simple. They provide non-trivial conditions for a theory to be uh, a holographic. Because if you check the theory, if, if I give you a theory and it doesn't satisfy these inequalities, it doesn't have to. If it doesn't satisfy them, then um, you, you, can, you can say that it doesn't have a gravity dual based on these entropy considerations. And um, an open, interesting question is, what is the holographic entropy cone for time-dependent states? So um, um, the only thing, uh, the only statement that I know so far is that at least in two boundary dimensions, they are the same as in a static case. So I think the higher dimensional case is a still open question. And um, next, I want to consider the uh, time evolution of entanglement entropy. This is best illustrated as in an example uh, where we have the thermal field double state and um, it is due to the eternal ADS black hole uh, in this way. 
And um, we can consider the union of half of the left CFT and half of the right CFT as our region A. So A contains a left with, it's a union of a left with a right. And we can also consider this region at some time t and study how it depends on t. Uh, the statement is using the HRT prescription, its entanglement entropy grows linearly in t. Um, this is related to the growth of the black hole interior. And in fact, uh, such growth has been uh, conjectured to correspond to the linear growth of com computational complexity of the state. So the complexity of a given state in quantum information theory is usually defined as the minimum number of gates to prepare such a state. Uh, a set of, you have a set of gates that can be used to prepare any state. And then for a particular state, you simply ask how many gates does it take to create such a state. Um, there are two proposals. One is called complexity equals volume, and the other is complexity equals the action. Um, so in either case, uh, you have either an, um, a minimal surface, or sorry, extremal surface on the particular slice um, whose volume characterizes the, the complexity, the volume grows as we go to later times. In the other case, we have the action of the willard witt patch defined in this way, and one can also show that the action grows as we go to later times. So I, want, I, I wanted to mention this because complexity, I think of complexity as also a useful probe of the structure of entanglement. Uh, one can consider uh, the same setup, but by adding interactions, create, uh, we can create traversable wormholes. This is, um, so just to uh, back up a little bit, if we consider, again, the thermal field double state, it's a highly entangled state, but the two CFTs are not talking to each other, so we cannot teleport from one side to the other side. But if we, so this means that the wormhole is not traversable, but if we um, add interactions, uh, even very simple one between the two sides, we can potentially make it traversable. Um, and this can be thought of as a quantum teleportation protocol that is a special one because it is dual to a classical uh, picture in the bulk where the, uh, the person being teleported uh, does not feel anything bizarre as it goes through this wormhole, as opposed to maybe in a generic case where something violent happens in the book. Um, it is possible to derive Einstein equations from entanglement. So we have seen that the proof of the RT formula relied on Einstein equations. Um, the, the fact that there is a minimal surface is, is, a, is a relic of a particular component of Einstein equations. We can go back, we can go in the other direction as well, derive Einstein equations from RT. Uh, the basic idea is to use the first law of entanglement entropy, uh, where we say that under a state variation, the change of the, the linearized change of the entropy is the same as the linearized change of the energy, where the energy is defined using the modular Hamiltonian. So the um, way to do this is to uh, apply this to a spherical disk in the CFT vacuum, so the original state is this state, um, and the modular Hamiltonian is locally determined from the CFT stress tensor. Uh, what this does for us is that then both sides are controlled by the bulk metric. On the left, we simply, have, we simply need to use the Rutakanagi formula to translate into an area statement. On the right, we have a statement about the CFT stress tensor, but they control the asymptotic limit of the metric. So um, uh, by using this, we can derive some constraint on the metric, turns out to be the linearized Einstein equation. There has been some further development going beyond the linearized level, but I think we still are not yet uh, at the full, fully non-linearized Einstein equation. Um, let me say something about bit threads. So um, uh, RT can be reformulated by using the maximal flow instead of minimal surfaces. Uh, this is basically so you can, uh, so the maximal flow is determined by a vector, well, a flow is a vector field that is divergentless and has uh, a limit on its norm. And um, if you try to, uh, uh, try to push as many 
as a much flux as possible through the region A, eventually you encounter some bottleneck, which turns out to be exactly the uh, minimal surface. So this is the max flow mean cut theorem that says the max flow is equal to the uh, area of the min minimal cut. Um, and the homology condition is obvious in this case. One advantage of this is that the maximal flow um, change continuously across phase transitions. I've seen the kind of phase transitions we saw before, whereas the minimal surface does not uh, change continuously. So the bit threat picture has been generalized to the HRT case as well. Um, let me say something about entanglement or purification. So given a mixed state of row AB, it may be purified into some larger Hilbert space, AA prime, BB prime, and the entanglement of purification is determined as the minimal uh, of the entropy of AA prime, uh, minimizing all possible choices of the purification. It has been conjectured to be holographically given by the entanglement wedge cross-section, so A and B are in a mixed state, and uh, the entanglement wedge of the union is this bulk region, and the cross-section is the dotted line. And um, I want to mention some uh, variant of this, which can be uh, established more concretely. Uh, this is the idea that we can def use modular flow to define a variant version of the Van, Van Neumann entropy, uh, which, is, which we call the modular minimal entropy, modular minimum and minimal entropy. And the statement is that it is given by the area of a constrained extremal surface. So let me define both of these two things. So we are considering two regions, and I call the two regions R and A, and gen generally they can be overlapping. And um, in general, I can define a modular evolved state uh, using the modular Hamiltonian of the region R to evolve the state with the modular time being parameterized by this S. In this new state, one can compute the Van Neumann entropy for A, the second region, and we can minimize over all choices of the modular time and define this modular minimum entropy. Um, this is holographically given by a constrained min extremal surface. The extremal surface, the surface is extremal, except when it intersects with the RT, HRT surface uh, of R, it, doesn't, it can have a cusp. So the picture, so this paper should, appearing, should be appearing now. And um, um, basically, the idea is that um, uh, you, can, you, can, you can think about this in a very obvious way when the modular flow is local. Uh, in this setup, we have chosen A to be the union of AL and AR, and R to be a union of AR and AR bar. So hopefully the notation is clear. And uh, the, uh, the statement is that the, um, the modular minimum entropy is given by exploring all possible uh, modular evolved state uh, in this case. And the minimum setup is actually to, to unevolve the right, hand, the, the right part of the system to t equals zero, as uh, can be shown here, um, where the entropy is more minimal than the previous HRT case. So, um, and in this case, it is equal, the area of this surface is equal to the area of this constrained minimal surface shown in the purple. This seems to be generally true and can indeed be proven in D equals two, uh, and a useful diagnostic for when the two surfaces intersect. Um, let me say something about entanglement in the Sitter holography. This is uh, the context where we have some solution of the Sitter um, or approximately the sitter uh, coming from string theory. And uh, the context where this is uh, studied is in the DSDS correspondence, uh, basically uh, an observation that higher dimensional the sitter can be written as a warped compactification of lower dimensional the sitter. And it suggests a dual description as, uh, of the higher dimensional the sitter solution as two matter sectors coupled to each other and to d-dimensional gravity. So it's reminiscent, but different from the thermal field double discussed previous, previously. In this case, the two sectors, sectors are cut off and coupled to each other, and to, also to lower dimensional gravity. 
Uh, it turns out the two sides are in the maximally entangled state to leading order, as we showed using entanglement rainy entropies in this setup. So for details, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hear more from Eva's talk. And uh, also, this gives uh, interpretations of a Gibbons Hawking entropy uh, because it matches the entanglement ranging entropies in this between the two different sectors. Um, in the remaining time, I'd like to quickly go over holographic error correction. I'm almost out of time, so I'll be, I'll be rather quick. Um, so why do we have quantum error correction at all? Um, because we um, find that the same bulk point, phi of x, here in the middle, can actually be represented in many different ways on the boundary. In this case, we can represent it on AB, BC, or AC. So obviously, they cannot be the same operator in the CFT. And the resolution of that is that, well, this is the defining feature of quantum error correction. We can, do this. We can find the same information in many different ways. That's how, we, if we lose some part of the system, we don't care too much. Uh, so holography is a quantum error correcting code, and we should think of these operators, these reconstructed operators, that they have the same action, they're different operators, but they act on the same way in the code subspace of states. Um, so there is a set of uh, dictionary between the two sides. If we have low energy bulk states, we have, uh, they correspond to states in the code subspace different CFT representations of the bulk operator are simply redundant implementations of the same logical operation. And algebra bulk operators that we have in the theory in, uh, in ADS-CFT simply corresponds to the algebra of some protected operators acting on the code subspace. And finally, the radial distance can be thought of as a level of protection. We have tensor network point models uh, that realizes these principles. I won't go over them. Um, and finally, well, I want to point out one quick thing about entanglement wedge reconstruction. It is the statement that any operator in the entanglement wedge of the region, A, may be represented as a CFT operator on A. There is a, some uh, quantum information way of making this precise. Let me skip that. Um, this is a new form of subregion duality. It goes beyond the old paradigm because Entanglement wedge can, in principle, reach behind black hole horizons. And this is, can be made valid to order in G. Um, there is a theorem that guarantees this is true based on quantum error correction. I won't have time to go through this, but you can refer to our papers. Um, and finally, we, so we saw that quantum error, uh, entanglement wedge reconstruction arises from um, basically a version of the quantum error corrected RT formula, this is in a previous slide, which I didn't have to go over. Uh, but this can also go in the other direction. Basically, in any quantum error correcting code with complementary recovery, uh, complementary recovery is simply a fancy way of saying entanglement wedge reconstruction. We have a version of the Rutakianagi formula with one loop quantum corrections. Let me conclude with some questions. So we have seen that patterns of entanglement provide a non-conventional uh, window towards understanding quantum field theory and gra gravity, um, we can ask, well, one thing that I'd like to understand is, can we generalize the entanglement-based proofs of the C, F, and A theorems in various dimensions to higher dimensions? Currently, we only have two, three, and four. Can we do five and six? We discussed alpha prime corrections to the RT formula perturbatively. Is there a stringy derivation that works for finite alpha prime? That would be very useful. And we also saw that the R2 formula with one loop quantum corrections matches quantum error correction with complementary, complementary recovery. Um, the, do high order corrections of the R2 formula mean anything in quantum error correction? How do we think about it in that context? This is non-trivial. Um, and in general, what, what are the conditions for quantum error correcting code to be holographic, to have a gravity dual? We'd like to understand that. And finally, I'd like to conclude with the question, how do we actually fully enjoy all of this in a context of black hole information problem and in a context of cosmology? Thank you.
have a quick comment and then a question. The quick comment is that I don't think the second law for black holes has been proven in its most general form for all, all higher derivative theories. Aaron's proof only works for linear perturbations. They, and as you know, that, that's not sufficient. I think it hints at a much more deeper structure for what the holographic entanglement entropy formula should be beyond two, two powers of extrinsic curvature. That's true. Uh, the question is, in the context of what you were discussing for this minimal modular entropy, am I understanding correctly that you're only looking at some part of your subsystem that's being evolved with the modular Hamilton of a different system? Yes. And then so there are two systems. Optimize that with respect to that. Yes, that's right. So the quantum corrected Ryu Takianaki formula that you mentioned involves the bulk entanglement entropy. <laughs> which yes. would include the bulk entanglement entropy due to gravitons. Yes. So is there a notion of what that actually means? And if there isn't, uh, is there a, a dual version of the problem in terms of defining the entanglement entropy on the boundary? So the uh, details of uh, the gravity contributions to high order are not fully understood. Um, one way to try to address that question is try to use some kind of replica trick and uh, uh, work, work with a fixed gauge and eventually hope that things work out nicely um, uh, after we sum over both the area term and the bulk entropy term. So each individual term may behave badly uh, in this particular scheme, but the hope is that the sum of the two is a good quantity that we can compute in an ambiguous way. I haven't seen an explicit calculation following this to higher orders in one of them. The same, que the same question that uh, we don't know how to split the graviton Hilbert space in two across a line because the constraints cross the line. And secondly, the line itself, if the metric is fluctuating, we don't know where the line is. Field rate definitions of the, of the metric by R mu nu and so on would, would move the line. So it's, it seems very hard to imagine how, how we're going to get a... Um, a definition of the boundary entropy that matches the bulk entropy, as you, as you seem to be saying there was on, on one of your slides. So yes, so let me first point out that the matching is probably not as strong as you would have hoped. The matching, is the, the right-hand side, the bulk calculation here, I'm only giving a perturbative uh, calculation. And to Just to first order, you, you stated all orders to perturbation there. Yes. Yes, so the idea, so to address the question that you had about the, the, where the surface is, so the, uh, again, this is, this is not explicitly done, but um, it is hoped that using some particular gauge, one can calculate this uh, for surfaces that are surf perturbatively close to the classical extremal surface. So and I'm not claiming that there is a way to calculate the bulk entropy for an arbitrary entangling surface in the bulk. Um, but there seems to be reasons to believe that there is a reasonable calculation for surfaces which are infinitesimally close to the classical extremal surface, which will be this case here because the, the, the difference between the two is higher order in G. Um, but again, as I said, um, nobody has done the calculation, so I don't know whether things will work out just nicely, once we calculate the two terms, the area term and as bulk term individually and add them up. I don't, I don't know. I think it's a great question to explore what happens when, when, when we do this, try to actually do this at high orders. But uh, stepping back a bit, why should we expect such a calculation to be well-defined? Because the notion of a local we don't expect local observables in, in quantum gravity, and so the surface would fluctuate. Uh, we, we wouldn't sh expect to have anything be so sharply defined in quantum gravity, would we? Well, perturbatively, I would say I think there is no problem in defining observables in the bulk with just Wilson lines. So again, I don't see an immediate problem in the perturbative regime. Even in the full non-perturbative regime, I, Surely, a lot of the, these things will have to change. Thank you. 
sorry, you almost said that, but uh, I think my understanding was that uh, these are intrinsically perturbative. So something you are doing on semi-classical background. So no matter what, uh, like loop order or higher quantum correction, you go to the graviton, it doesn't have any back reaction. Because this way of doing, you can't really, you know, back react to say Hawking radiation other than just putting by hand uh, kind of evaporating of idea black hole. So that's why at this order, it's like a space time is static. So I think you can, is that, is that, is that, do you agree or no? Well, I, I would have said, I would have said there is a way of back reacting on a geometry perturbative. So yeah, in other words, yeah. in other words, in other words, you can define a quantum corrected metric, which has an expansion order by order in G. Um, and, and each order is fixed by the equation, a quantum corrected okay. equation of motion okay. Okay. Sure. coming from matter fields and gravitons and so on. But still not, you're not, not productive. It's not non perturbative at all. Com comes from uh, fluctuations of bulk fields, which is supposed to be of order into the zero. But we can't define uh, entanglement entropy without defining a boundary condition. And we know that some theories of gravity are forced to have uh, boundary interactions which scale with fractional powers, fractional uh, uh, negative powers of the Newton constant. Uh, are you sure that there aren't contributions from that that are larger than into the zero? <laughs> yeah, just on this issue, there is one case where you don't need the boundary, like for the disk entanglement. You can just map it to Euclidean sphere, and that has a perfectly well-defined one over n expansion. Yes, so, and in, so that, in that case, the quantum extremal surface is fixed by symmetry. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and I think even there is some understanding uh, about one over n corrections in the bulk from graviton loops from basically corrections to radius of ADS. Thanks. For Simeon's question, the, the short answer is I don't know. But to, I mean, you, you said many times that you do know, or it's supposed to be the case in general, that the first correction to Ryu Takianagi is of order n to the zero. I mean, do you think that that's definitely true, maybe true, you hope it's true, or... I, I couldn't tell what levels of truth many of these statements I, in the I, talk. I believe was there is, was a calculation using, uh, in the, essentially, at this order, one can uh, do a free graviton calculation using certain boundary conditions. And there was a calculation that shows the um, correction at this order is indeed n to the zero under that set of boundary conditions for Einstein gravity. So I don't know the more what happens goes going beyond that. Um, thanks. Okay, first I would like to, um, uh, can you hear me? Um, thanks. First I would like to thank the organizers very much for uh, organizing this uh, fantastic conference um, and, uh, and giving me this opportunity to speak. One thing I'm very confident about is that I'm uh, I'm uh, uh, least knowledgeable about string theory among all the speakers, so please feel free to point out any uh, uh, anything wrong if I if I say anything wrong. Um, um, okay, so so the, today I will talk about a, a work I um, collaborated with uh, Juan Malasina when I was uh, on uh, uh, sabbatical at the institute. So it's about the eternal traversable wormhole. Um, 
a deal where uh, we are only talking about that in 2D. Um, is it the way to flip? Um, so so the, the goal is to summarize the in this picture. So uh, we will propose a deal theory for a geometry that's global ADS2. So I'm going to explain both sides in more details. Um, so the global uh, ADS2 geometry is just the ADS2 geometry with a particular under condition. And, uh, uh, and that has, that's what we call the uh, traversable wormhole because it has two boundaries that are causally connected. And that's uh, the deal theory we propose is a modified version of the such deal E K type model, which is some uh, some Marana fermions with uh, interaction. And uh, um, so the outline of the talk is we will uh, start from some overviews of the of the ADS2 and the SYK and the known duality between them in other uh, the other boundary conditions. And then we will talk about our proposal and then an analyze the, the theory from the low energy and also from some uh, other limit that we could understand, which is the large Q limit. Um, so, so that's the purpose of that is to go beyond the low energy limit. So in the end, uh, that will give us some interesting insight about something like Hawking page transition in this uh, system. Um, how do I flip? Anyone know how to flip the slide? Oh, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I will start from the Jacquet Tetherbaum uh, gravity. That's our starting point. So it's a two-dimensional dilaton gravity. Um, and uh, as we know, there is no bulk graviton. So the, the metric uh, is uh, fixed to be uh, ADS in the bulk. And the only physical uh, dynamical degree of freedom is the dilaton. Uh, and the boundary condition is said to be a constant value of the dilaton. So it's like an equal, equal value control of the dilaton. So when you find different solutions of, uh, of the theory, you get different values of delta on the boundary so that you also get uh, a different uh, play position of the boundary. For example, you could have the uh, one solution corresponding to the boundary being the boundary of the Pankaray patch, or you can find another solution where the boundary is like uh, uh, two boundaries of an uh, 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 eternal black hole. So these are all solutions of the same theory. Uh, and in these two cases, you don't need that matter field. But the matter field will play an important role in our discussion. Uh, as we see, you are not going to get the global ADS2 uh, um, if you don't have the matter. Um, OK, so then uh, just to mention that uh, this theory, uh, because the bulk has no degree of freedom, you can reduce it to a boundary dynamics, which is described by the Strachan uh, der derivative term. And that describes the reparameterization of time along the boundary. Um, and uh, so the corresponding, uh, the, the theory that's, uh, that's uh, approximately uh, due to this, uh, uh, this uh, um, SYK, uh, that due to this uh, gravity is the SYK model. It was proposed a long time ago by uh, Sachiv and Ye, but related to uh, holography in a modified version by uh, Alexei Kitaev. So the model it has a, a simple and well-defined Hamiltonian, which describes interacting Marana fermion. So you consider n Marana fermions, which uh, are interacting with a, 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 a interaction term that can be four body or it can be generalized to Q body. This is the Q parameter that we are going to talk about later. So you have a, a random coupling and uh, uh, compared to other, say, condensed matter systems with this multi-fermion interaction, the only thing that's special here is first that uh, you don't have a uh, uh, you don't have bilinear terms like kinetic energy. Uh, second, uh, this J is completely random, so the interaction is completely random, uh, uh, um, independent random numbers coupling these different fermions. There is also a complex fermion generalization of this uh, model. Uh, we will focus on the the Marana fermion version, so we don't need to think about extra conservation law. Um, so this model. Um, can be solved by um, averaging over disorder. And in an ordinary disordered system, you have to do the replica trick and consider the average of uh, uh, um, multiple replicas of the partition function. But in this model, it has been shown that uh, in the large n limit, when you have many Marana fermions, 
model self averages, and uh, uh, you actually can only look at partition function of one copy. Um, and, uh, and in that case, uh, the, the other param you, you get a, a large n uh, other parameter. So it's just like a mean field theory. And uh, there is a two-point function which has a small fluctuation in the large n limit. So you could treat that as a, a classical uh, C number and then use that as your other parameter. The only difference from the more familiar mean field theory, like a superconducting other parameter or superfluid, the, the only difference is this other parameter itself is a function of two time variables. So it's a, it's a, it's a non local um, other parameter. And uh, uh, so you can, um, you can solve, uh, you can find the value of this other parameter by doing a Dyson equation. Uh, we will talk about that uh, later. But uh, once you find this uh, solution, the interesting thing is uh, you get a power law um, kind of solution uh, at low energy. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, you, get this, uh, you, you get the conclusion that the, the low energy physics of this model is described by an approximate uh, one-dimensional conformal field theory. And uh, uh, when you look at low energy excitations, they are actually described by Reparameterizations of time, uh, which means conformal transformation uh, in 1D, uh, it, it's, a, it's obtained by starting from that power law solution and then do reparameterization. So, so basically, because the dimension is so low, you don't need to think about other excitations. You just uh, uh, think about doing conformal transformation, and that gives you all these low energy excitations. And the, because of that, uh, if you think about what are the low energy uh, fluctuations in the system, it's actually given by all these time reparameterizations, quotient those that preserve the set point solution, which is SL2R. So you get this low energy uh, manifold that's, uh, that's uh, reparameterizations quotient SL2R, and that's described by exactly the same effective action as, uh, um, as in the, in, in the, as the uh, Jacob Telebrom gravity, it's the Slashian term. So in that sense, this model, the low energy physics of this model is uh, approximately due to the JT gravity. Uh, although there is a difference that uh, in this model, if you analyze uh, the excitation spectrum carefully, you find there is also an infinite tower of massive matter field in the bulk. So more precise statement is the model looks like, uh, looks like a dual of a, a gravity theory coupled to many matter fields. But this, this coupling is weak, and these matter fields uh, do not alter the, uh, do not give you a bigger uh, effect on the gravitational sector. Uh, okay, so more precisely, uh, because all these large end approximations we can only do in finite temperature and finite and low temperature, uh, we um, we are actually talking about the thermal double um, thermal field double of the uh, SYK model. So we can sorry. thank you. Uh, we are actually talking about a thermal field double. So you have heard from C's talk uh, about what is the thermal field double. So if you think about a, a purific it's a purification of the thermal ensemble. When you think about uh, uh, two, so, so, so instead of one copy of SYK, the thermal field double is defined for two copies of this SYK model. So you have two n Marana fermions. And uh, if you trace over one half of one site, then the other, uh, the other site uh, uh, is in the thermal state. And uh, by just analytic continuation of the thermal correlator, we get correlation functions in the thermal field double which is due to that uh, uh, eternal black hole geometry. So, so, this is, so this is a simple example that when we say this, um, this model with this given state and Hamiltonian is due to uh, that particular geometry, we need to specify what is the, where is the boundary. So that's where uh, this, uh, this when we, there, uh, in some sense, we have different uh, dual geometries, although the only difference is where you put the geometry, where you put the boundary. So like when you, uh, when, when, now if I want to realize a different geometry, I would need to either change the state or the Hamiltonian or, or both. So that's uh, uh, what we are going to do. We want to uh, find a dual theory of the global ADS2 geometry. And the global ADS2 geometry is simply defined by putting the boundary at a constant, constant line here. So instead of being invariant under boost, which is in the black hole case, you consider a geometry that's invariant under time translation in that direction. Um, so, and that uh, is known, uh, it's known that uh, to realize such a geometry, you have to have some negative energy matter because otherwise you will violate, uh, um, um, I mean, because, because that you have to violate the null energy condition. 
uh, otherwise you couldn't make the dilaton field go down and up along a light ray. And, and so this, is, this problem uh, is closely related to these eternal uh, wormhole proposals of uh, Gao, Jeffries, and Wall, and uh, uh, also Mao and Stanford Young. So, so, uh, so uh, similar to their case, in order to create such a traversable wormhole, because you could send signal from one boundary to the other, in order to create such a traversable wormhole, you have to have some non-local coupling. So the reason why uh, uh, we, we can have a, a violation of the, the null energy condition, we could uh, create this kind of traversable wormhole is now we are allowed, we allow ourselves to turn on some non-local coupling between the two boundaries. Um, so, so, uh, so the difference uh, uh, of our case from the previous work is we want to consider this eternal traversable wormhole, which means uh, um, you have a time translation symmetry. Uh, rather than, uh, instead of opening the wormhole a little bit, you want to have a, a wormhole that's open uh, forever, at least if you don't throw too many things in it. Um, and the basic idea is, so the, 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 the hint that how do we construct such a state, the hint is, uh, if you look at the state of this system at a given time, um, it's basically the same state as this one. If you imagine this uh, 2D gravity as dimensional reduction from higher dimensions, then this line will be like a, a spatial wormhole. And that's also a spatial wormhole. And the key difference is their time evolution is different. The time evolution here is trivial. This one, the wormhole will become longer in time if you go up. So, so basically, our goal is to find uh, some, uh, some uh, state that's like a thermal field double state, because we know what this state is. We find something like a thermal field double state, but the time evolution is designed such that the thermal field double state is a ground state. So, so we, we, in that way, the goal is more clear. And in principle, you could do that, right? You, you, you're given a well-defined state. You can design a Hamiltonian. And moreover, the sum of a double state is special enough so that, the, so that uh, uh, it's not uh, going to be too hard to find a Hamiltonian for that. It means it's not like a very highly entangled state uh, so that the Hamiltonian must be super complicated. Uh, it, it has short range correlation. Uh, so our proposal, which is of course also closely related to the uh, gauge Race wall proposal, the, 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 the proposal is uh, the correct Hamiltonian we consider is uh, uh, taking two copies of the SYK model and add a relevant coupling. So uh, the simplest one we could add is just add a bilinear term of the fermion. Um, so the intuition here, the, the very rough intuition here is when you turn on, when you take these two uh, almost a conformal field series, which have a, a, lot, a lot of low energy states. Then you turn on this small coupling, then the small coupling is not going to couple the high energy states a, a lot. They, so the, the new ground state you get is basically a superposition that's mainly consists of low energy states. So it's not surprising that if you look at the entanglement between the two systems in the ground state, it's more entangled between the low energy states. So in that sense, it's more like a thermal state. The, the weight is higher at low temperature, low energy. Um, but uh, more uh, precisely, uh, what we, uh, if you want to be a little more precise than this naive, uh, um, naive argument, naive uh, intuition, uh, you can think uh, variationally. As we dis discussed uh, previously, the low energy degrees of freedom in this theory are given by these reparameterizations of that other parameter. So previously, your ground state corresponds to one particular point in that uh, manifold of reparameterization. That's, that corresponds to, say, this power law correlated to one function. And, and then the, others, the other copy will be the same if you don't couple them. And then when you turn on the coupling, but the coupling is small, you, you, you still stay in that low energy manifold. But uh, because of the coupling, you modify, you move it to somewhere else. So you can think of in this way as like you are variationally finding the optimal solution in this uh, low energy manifold. And, uh, and that gives you uh, this uh, ground state, which looks like some of your double state, because you don't really have much choice uh, by finding a state that has the entanglement between the two, state, two systems. The correlation is transitioning around in time. And uh, um, yeah, so in the end, you find uh, um, the some of your double state. And I just want to mention that uh, there is qualitatively similar phenomena in higher dimensional CFTs. Uh, for, uh, this is a, a work where we studied the, the uh, two, one plus one CFT. So when you turn on relevant coupling between CFTs and open the gap, I think it's generic that this, the, the resulting state looks like thermal field double state uh, in long wavelength. 
but the but the in in the one D case we are going to talk about here, we have much more understanding because the conformal symmetry is so large in that in this uh, dimension. Uh, we actually understand the low energy spectrum and so on, and these were, these are different from the high, uh, higher dimensional case. So okay, so uh, so once you have this uh, kind of conjecture, then then the, the way to verify that is is basically so this is basically describing that variational procedure I'm I'm saying. So if you have this uh, uh, this uh, correlation between two sides, and you want to decide what is the reparameterization that optimizes this Hamiltonian, basically the two point coupling in the Hamiltonian term translated into a reparameterized conformal correlator between the two boundaries. And then you are looking at this, this different, uh, different change of the boundary and minimize. And in the end, the minimization gives you that, uh, that uh, the boundary will be like, uh, so the, if the boundary are like these straight lines, then the variational procedure tells you where the straight lines are. Uh, if you turn on a bigger mu, they move in. These two sides have more correlation, so they move in. Uh, and, uh, and this uh, effective temperature, which tells you how far are these two boundaries to each other, the effective temperature is a fractional power of uh, the coupling mu you turn on. And the power is basically telling you the dimension of mu. Okay, so then, then uh, the corresponding correlation function, once you get the solution, that means uh, that predict uh, that uh, in this uh, new system with the coupling, say for example, the two-point function will be something like this, which is oscillating in real time. So it looks like the, what we are familiar with in thermal correlator, but in thermal case, it's oscillating in imaginary time. Uh, here it's oscillating in real time, which is actually telling you that the system uh, becomes sort of integrable at low energy. It's, uh, you, you see things like a, a harmonic oscillator, but the frequency is renormalized. It's like some uh, non-trivial power of the, uh, of the ultraviolet coupling. Okay, so I would like to give some intuition about uh, uh, what's happening here. So, so I want to emphasize that uh, the fact that we get the, the gap, which is, uh, which is the oscillation frequency, that's a fractional power of mu, uh, is a very interesting thing. The fractional power is smaller than one. And that means that at small mu, this gap you get is much bigger than what you would get if you don't have the, cup, if you don't have the J term. If you don't have the SYK interaction, just have the coupling itself, you also get just uh, oscillations, right, the free uh, harmonic oscillators. Uh, but in that case, uh, you actually get a much smaller gap. So these interactions are actually helping you to, to make the, the fermions go to the other side much faster. And the, the reason, I think, is schematically in this picture, the reason is that even if you have n fermions, if you don't have interaction to help you, then only one term will contribute. If you put one fermion on the left, it will turn out to the right by that one term of the coupling. But when you have interactions, this fermion can decay into a very complicated multi-fermion operator, and then the coupling term could tunnel all of them to the right side. So that could actually enhance the, uh, the matrix element of, the, of this, uh, this procedure. So, so and because, this, uh, very, uh, because of the symmetry uh, of the Hamiltonian of the left side and the right side, what happened is once this multi-fermion state tunnels to the other side, they unscramble and go back to a simple fermion operator. And, uh, uh, and this is only possible because the two J's are perfectly the same. And, and uh, uh, also, if you think uh, uh, what's, what's happening uh, in, in time, in real time, uh, so, so we could uh, uh, imagine uh, doing some Suzuki Trotter decomposition just to help our understanding. So like, uh, uh, we understand more or less what happened in the original SYK model. So, so if you think about some so the time evolution by the coupled Hamiltonian, if we approximate that by like time evolution uh, uh, by, uh, by the original SYK Hamiltonian without coupling for some time delta t, and then turn on the turn on, uh, evolution by only the coupling term and alter that. So that's, that's for a small delta t, that's the same as just doing time evolution in this coupled Hamiltonian. And, and, and uh, as uh, our results show that in this case, your sum of your double state will stay the same state. On the other hand, if you only have this time evolution, we know what happened is the black hole time evolution. It's like you are going to get scrambling correlation function between the two, between two sides of the thermal field double will die exponentially in time. So what happened is that part of the new, the coupling term saved you from scrambling. So, you, so the picture is like this, like you, you start here and then you are going out, which means the correlation is dying in this part of the time evolution. And then you are saved by the other term. 
And then you can, if you periodically do this, you can hold this uh, black hole from scrambling. It's like a quantum computer that instead of you just use it until it dies, you, you, you can keep cleaning your, your patch and then, uh, and then uh, use it for a long time. So, so uh, once we understand how to do this uh, eternal black hole, eternal warm hole, uh, we could do these non-eternal ones as a special case. You could basically start from a thermal double state and turn on the coupling for, for some time and then turn it off. So this is, this is how you reduce to the previous works. Okay, so, uh, uh, so then you could also study low energy excitations because uh, performance symmetry is very uh, uh, constraining. So you have this SL2R gauge symmetry and the SL2R gauge symmetry uh, uh, tells you you could, uh, you could uh, uh, parameterize the boundary in a symmetric way and then reduce that to a quantum mechanical problem. So basically, so previously we have always been talking about, uh, we have always been talking about the static solution, which is like the minimal of this potential. You could also consider other solutions, and other solutions contain these uh, bound states, which are like slightly fluctuating boundaries, uh, but also contain these itinerator solutions, and these itinerator solutions are like a continuous spectrum, which actually correspond to black holes in the So, um, so these itinerant spectrum correspond to black holes, and then the bound states correspond to like a graviton. And when you think about quantum effect in finite n, then uh, the, then you uh, you get this quantized the harmonic uh, quantized the oscillator state. They are harmonic oscillator at low energy. And uh, uh, but in addition, remember there are also matter fields. So the matter fields are conformally invariant, and they basically have the spectrum of of a bulk matter field in ADS two. So the low energy spectrum contains two parts: the gravitons. Uh, and the matter field. Okay, so in the uh, last uh, like uh, five minutes, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about what happened go beyond the, uh, the the low energy limit. So if we don't assume low energy, we cannot ap apply these reparameterization uh, pictures. We just go back to the original like uh, SYK model and do a Schrodinger Dyson equation and solve them. So you could solve them numerically. Uh, or you could uh, do some uh, analytical results in large Q. So I'm just showing some numerics here. Uh, but the interesting limit where you could do some more uh, analytical result is in the large Q limit. And what happened there is in that large Q limit, uh, uh, you can have an interesting situation where the, the Green's functions are very close to free value, but the self energy are not close to free value, um, the form of the self energy. So, and the, the interesting thing is in that limit, uh, the effective action becomes like a alluvial action, where, because you are talking about uh, two-point functions, so the two times become like a light-like coordinates of a alluvial theory. So that allows us to do some analytic solution, and then this, uh, this coupling term shows up as a, as, a, um, as a boundary condition in the alluvial field. And that uh, gives us this, uh, 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 so in the end, you can check, like the gap goes like square root of mu, which is consistent with our uh, our uh, low energy analysis. But the, the really uh, interesting thing is now once we go beyond the low, temp low energy limit, we could consider what happened at finite temperature. So uh, to clarify, this is not the temperature we talk about in the thermal field double. That's like the gap of this theory. Uh, we are talking about taking this couple theory, put that in a finite temperature. So that's like taking our ADS2 and then, uh, and then Put it, put it in the imaginary time and then make the time periodic, just like that. Uh, do some quotient. And then, uh, then we know what happened in higher dimensional ADS if you do that at finite temperature. You find this Hawking phase transition. A low temperature looks like thermal gas and high temperature looks like black hole. Here, the interesting thing is the same thing happened. Uh, and numerically, we find that first order phase transition. So you have this hysteresis curve if you find the solution, gradually reduce the temperature, and then gradually increase the temperature, you find it follows a different curve. And that tells you that this is free energy. It tells you that you actually have uh, multiple saddle points in a given temperature window. And this is true for all Q. From Q to 4, Q to 4 to all the way to large Q, you always have this uh, first order transition. And uh, I would like to emphasize that this is not obviously, sh uh, it's not obvious that this sh should be the case. In, in, if you have a well-defined semi-classical bulk deal, you should expect that this thing to happen. But here, uh, you have this many, you have a large number of matter fields in the bulk. So the matter field contribution uh, to the free energy is the same order as the gravitational contribution. So, so naively, you would say, I could have a crossover. I, just, uh, uh, I could just cross over between them rather than 
having a phase transition. But uh, in, in fact, we find that you always have this phase transition. And moreover, uh, by studying the large Q case analytically, you actually find that uh, in, in addition to the two phases, you actually have an have a unstable saddle point in the middle, which uh, corresponds to like the small black hole phase. And similar to the hawking page transition case, the small black hole phase is actually stable if you look at the, the macro-canonical ensemble. So let me explain that. So this is a curve that just shows the solution in large Q. So I, don't go, I, I won't go to details, but this is a parameter that parameterizes the correlation length in time. And, and, uh, and uh, that parameter, it parameterizes our solution. But the temperature is not a monotonous function of that parameter. So that's why at a given temperature within this range, you have multiple solutions. And then uh, uh, two of these solutions correspond to, two of these solutions correspond to um, um, uh, these, uh, these two phases, uh, the low temperature, the, um, the, the thermal gas phase and the large black hole phase. And there is a third solution, which from the canonical ensemble point of view, you would say that's unstable and it never show up uh, in the canonical ensemble. But now if you plot the same curve, you, if you plot the, uh, what happened to the energy of the solution, energy and entropy, which is suitable for macro-canonical ensemble. If you plot that as a function of that one parameter, you see it's a monotonous, which means uh, uh, there is a region of energy which, uh, uh, where, where you have this uh, unstable uh, saddle point. Uh, now it's stable in the, in the macro-canonical ensemble. And that part of the curve has a negative specific heat. So you, at least now we have this, uh, uh, this well-defined quantum mechanical model uh, that uh, where you can find this uh, negative specific heat region, which is like a, like a small black hole or flat space black hole. Um, so I think that's an interesting feature uh, that may help us uh, understanding, say, for example, evaporation of small black holes. So I will end, uh, end here. And uh, so in summary, uh, we find these interesting features uh, that are similar to uh, um, gravitational theory. But uh, uh, I would like to mention, so there are several open questions, uh, like higher dimensional generalization and uh, how do we relate, how do we learn something about black hole interior? And maybe some of these are not open anymore. You may hear it from uh, Juan's talk. I got, I got confused about something which I should have understood before. Usually, I think of the thermofield double as the zero energy state of left Hamilton and minus right Hamilton. You're proposing here that you can make the thermofield double as a ground state of a coupled system of two, right. two, two models. How right. generic is this beyond SYK? I think uh, uh, if you don't require the Hamiltonian to be exactly local, but uh, um, say exponentially local. Well, in this case, local means uh, like few body. Like, uh, I think if, if you think it that way, then I think it's generic. So, so, so if the picture is more clear in higher dimensions, if I if I have a, say some of the double of one plus one CFT, then the reason why we could cook up a Hamiltonian that's quasi-local with this as a ground state is this state itself has a simple correlation behavior. The correlation function decays exponentially in uh, in in space. So, so it, it has the correct behavior of a, of a ground state. It has the entanglement entropy that's area law if you look at two chains together. So I think it's generic, but it doesn't mean you could really find the exact Hamiltonian which is exactly local. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.
The first speaker of this session is uh, Juan Maldacena, and the title is the uh, Transverse of Wormholes, I guess. Now, oh, yeah. Well, it, thanks to the organizers for organizing the wonderful conference at this wonderful location. And I also thank them for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, this is uh, work that we have done with uh, two students. And it's also based on work we did with, uh, with Xiao Lang, who spoke uh, previously. So the whole talk is summarized by this picture. Uh, it will be about presenting a solution that has this shape which is a picture that John Wheeler drew in 1966. Uh, it's a picture of a three-dimensional space with a, a wormhole-like uh, connection between two, two points. And we have, um, let's say, flux lines that go from one to the other. And he was calling this charge without charge or mass without mass, in the sense that in general relativity, you can have um, this type of, um, in principle, this type of configurations. Uh, where it looks uh, from here that you have some charge, but really there is no charge source anywhere. And so the geometry will be, this is the spatial geometry. There is also time. Uh, time never shrinks anywhere. And so the total geometry will be that of a traversable wormhole. Okay, so before we start, let's uh, re recall some classic results. Um, so the first one is that there are no science fiction wormholes. So those are wormholes where it's shorter to go through the wormhole than going through the ambient space. Um, so uh, these uh, are forbidden by uh, first uh, by two things. First, Einstein equations, together with the so-called a chronal average null energy condition. Let me try to explain what that is. Um, that's the idea that if you take uh, you take a null ray, uh, which is uh, a chronal. So a chronal means that uh, all points along this null ray are light-like separated, but they are not time-like separated. So you can will later see examples where that's not the case. So an achronal line is, uh, roughly speaking, the fastest line in a given space-time. And so, the second con so this condition is a condition on matter, saying that the stress tensor integrated along this null line uh, should be positive. Uh, now, this is, has not yet been proven in a general space-time. Uh, it certainly has been proven in flat space, but it, it's believed to hold in uh, quantum field theory. Of course, the condition is non-trivial uh, for quantum in quantum physics. Um, now, these results uh, do not forbid a longer wormhole. So uh, you could have a wormhole where it takes longer to go through the wormhole than it takes to go uh, through the ambient space. Um, now, that's uh, not possible in classical physics due to the null energy condition, so the same integrated null energy condition. That's automatically positive in classical physics, regardless of whether it's the fastest null line or not. Um, however, it, um, so one way to understand that is that we can go to the covering space, which, uh, and then in the covering space, so there's uh, one cycle here, we can go to the covering space, and in the covering space would be forbidden by the previous case. But in any case, if we wanted to find a solution like this, uh, we would need some quantum effects so that that uh, null energy condition uh, it's not obeyed, and then we'll be able to find the solution. So we have to find the solution with some negative uh, Casimir-like energy. And the question is uh, whether we can do it in a controllable way, because we would be balancing some classical terms against some quantum terms. Um, now, let me first uh, remind you of a situation where you can have an integrated null energy, which is negative. And that simple situation arises in two space-time dimensions, where you have a circle uh, times a time direction, and you consider a null line that wraps around the circle. Um, now, this line is not achronal, so there are two points, for example, these two points along the, la the, la the line are time-like separated. Okay? So, because it's not achronal, the uh, integrated null energy might be negative, and indeed it's negative, because uh, t minus minus is uh, minus c over 24, and then uh, this leads to this negative energy. So this is the negative Casimir energy, and it's a quantum effect, and you probably all have seen it in this context. Um, now, the necessary elements for constructing the solution we are going to discuss are uh, we need some something looking like a circle to have a negative Casimir energy, um, and we need uh, we will need a large number of bulk fields to uh, incise the, 
to enhance the size of quantum effects. And we'll show how to assemble these elements in a few steps and in a very simple theory. Um, so the theory we are going to discuss is uh, a theory that contains um, gravity, so Einstein gravity, and then a U1 gauge field, and a massless fermion that is charged under the U1 gauge field. Okay. So that, those are the necessary ingredients. And at this level, we just need only one, one fermion or a small number of fermions. Um, now, these elements are uh, very simple, and they are even present in the standard model. Uh, so the standard model, we have a uh, U1 gauge field, which would be the U1 of hypercharge. And uh, we also have fermions. The fermions in the standard model are massive. But if we go to short enough distan distances, they are massless, effectively massless. And so we'll be, uh, we'll be in that regime where, let's say, we, are going to consider so we could consider solutions at very short distances. Um, now the first, uh, so we'll assemble the solution in a few steps. So first we start with some well-known solutions. So the first well-known solution is an extremal uh, black hole uh, with magnetic charge. So we have some flux of the magnetic, the U1 uh, gauge field on the S2, uh, which is quantized. So this Q is an integer, and this Q will give us, so varying Q, we get uh, different solutions. Uh, the solution looks like flat space far away. And then when you get to a size of order Q in Planck units, I'm setting up Planck to one, uh, then it becomes curved and develops a long throat, which has a geometry of ADS2 times S2. So that's the geometry deep down this extremal throat. And the mass of this object is equal to the charge. Um, the next solution is a near extremal black hole. So it's more or less the same as before. Uh, the difference is that now uh, we have a horizon here down uh, this road with finite temperature. And um, the mass is slightly bigger than the extremal mass uh, by, uh, by something proportional to the square of the temperature. And we are at very, very small temperature, so that this is a very small quantity compared to Q. Um, we can also express it in terms of the inverse temperature. And the inverse temperature is, roughly speaking, the length of the throat. Um, or more precisely, is the redshift factor between the top of the throat and the bottom of the throat. Or alternatively, is the time it takes for a light signal to come uh, from the outside, go down the throat, and let's say we put a mirror, uh, let's say one ADS radius away from the horizon, and then it reflects back out. That time is, as measured from the outside, is also given by beta. Okay? So it roughly, in that sense, is the beta is the length of the throat, and will play an important role later. OK, so that's, uh, those are the two solutions. And now uh, we, we bring in the third character, which is the fermion, the charged fermion. So we have these uh, charged fermions, which um, uh, are filling this magnetic field on the sphere. Um, and therefore, there is a Landau level. Um, there are Landau levels. Uh, this, 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 the states of the fermions will fill various Landau levels. And um, there is a particular Landau level with precisely zero energy. Um, and that's because the, uh, not normally when you consider spinless particles, there is, uh, there is a positive energy Landau level. Um, but uh, when you have spin, the spin of the electron can, uh, can anti-align with the magnetic field and then um, have a negative, uh, ne negative energy contribution, which precisely cancels the orbital contribution. We get a precisely uh, zero energy Landau level. Uh, this uh, can be explained also by an anomaly argument. Basically, we, um, I mean, this, of course, you can find by solving the equation. But um, you can say that you start with massless fermions, uh, which have a U1 chiral symmetry. And then the 4D anomaly uh, reduces to a 2D anomaly in the two directions. One is the direction along the magnetic field, and there is a time direction. And so there should be massless fermions along those two dimensions. Um, um, OK. so. Uh, this uh, lowest Landau level has a degeneracy equal to Q. Um, Q, uh, is the f I remind you, is the flux of the magnetic field on the sphere. And they also form a spin J representation, which uh, has, again has dimension Q under the SU2 rotation symmetry of the sphere. Um, so uh, just from this single four-dimensional fermion, uh, we get Q two-dimensional fermions. So fermions that move along the radial and time direction uh, in this situation. So uh, one of the, this is one of the crucial ideas, is that when uh, Q is large, we also get a large number of fields for free, without having to put that in 
uh, from the very beginning that we have a large number of fields. So uh, we get this multiplier effect due to this uh, degeneracy in the lowest Landau level. Um, now each of each of these states, each of these Q states, can be viewed as uh, following a magnetic field line. So uh, very much the same as uh, when we have electrons that follow the magnetic field lines in the Earth, we have something similar here with this lowest uh, Landau levels. So we have, let's say, a magnetic field line, and then we have an electron, uh, a charged fermion, that is uh, localized with a wave function that has a size of the order of one flux quantum um, along uh, in the transverse dimensions. And then that uh, fermion is massless in the radial and time direction, and so we have roughly a massless field that moves along uh, this uh, field line. Okay, so that's, uh, that was the third element. So now uh, there's uh, the element that has to do with the near horizon geometry. So we'll do something special with the near horizon geometry. So here in the, uh, the left-hand side is just the Penrose diagram of ADS2, of uh, all of ADS2. Uh, when we look at the near horizon geometry of that near extremal black hole that we mentioned, uh, we get a geometry that looks like a portion of uh, that ADS2. So we get a geometry where uh, there is a time, an isometry, which is uh, time-like in this red region, that corresponds to the exterior of the black hole. And this uh, time-like isometry then uh, matches on to the time isometry far away in uh, four-dimensional uh, flat space. Um, Okay, so that's uh, so. This is the kind of geometry we get. This is the exterior of a near extremal black hole, and this is the other uh, the other copy when we have the thermal field double or the full Schwarzschild solution. Um, now, uh, when we connect them to flat space, so we are really cutting off this ADS2 space at some position, at some radial position, and then gluing that to four-dimensional flat space. So we don't have the black region in the geometries. Uh, instead of the black region, we have some connecting region to flat space, and then all of flat space. Okay. Um, now, um, and so here, for example, let's for, so, so, but instead of considering that geometry, what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, with the global ADS2, ADS2 geometry uh, that has a time translation symmetry where, where that, well, in these coordinates, we are making manifest the time translation symmetry, which is different than this one. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to cut it off at some, uh, some radial position uh, and remove the black regions and replace that by a connecting region, again, and four-dimensional flat space in such a way that uh, this time-like uh, translation symmetry becomes the time translation symmetry of Minkowski space far away. Okay. Now, it's more or less clear that we can do that. I mean, if you think about the spatial slice, it's uh, basically the same as this spatial slice. And along these spatial slice, we can certainly connect to flat space and have the full spatial slice surface of flat space. And uh, we'll be, and so these two spatial slices are essentially the same. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, when, we have, when we are connecting them to flat space and so on, uh, we get some non-zero energy, um, which was that near extremal energy we saw before, which was proportional uh, in that, this case to the temperature. But let's instead think Instead of thinking of this as a temperature, let's think of this as the length of this throat, uh, this effective length of this throat. And so in this case, again, when uh, this throat has some the same effective length, we also expect uh, the, same, the same energy, at least from the gravitational contribution. So uh, we have these two, uh, these two, let's say, extremal black holes, and then we connect them, uh, connect these throats in such a way that the geometry here in the throat region looks like a global ADS2. Okay? That's, a, that's a, a geometry. So that's a geometry so far. It's not yet a, it's not yet a solution. Um, so we have a geometry that looks basically the picture we, we saw before. So this is the ADS2 times S2 uh, wormhole. And then we have magnetic field lines that come in, uh, in, in this, this, on this side of the wormhole and go out on the other. Because of that, this is a positively charged uh, object, and then this is a negatively charged uh, object. Uh, this is not a solution yet, but it's certainly not a black hole, because we have a global uh, time-like uh, healing vector, and we have no horizon, and so on. So now, uh, let's uh, look at what the, Fermi the trajectories of these fermion fields are in uh, this geometry. So we have 
uh, we have the magnetic field lines uh, are closed and the fermions uh, follow these magnetic field lines and so we have charged fermions, uh, these charged fermions are moving on this circle. So that's the circle we wanted to find. So we really have these massless fermions living on a, on a circle. And for that reason, uh, we'll have a Casimir energy involving the length of the circle. Now, um, as, a first, uh, as a first solution, we are going to consider a situation where this distance is much smaller than, let's say, the length of the throat. And then, a posteriori, we will check that that, uh, that is correct. There will be a range of distances where uh, that will be true. Uh, and so in that case, the Casimir energy comes purely basically from the length of the throat and not from, uh, not from the distance in, in, ambient, in ambient space of between the two black holes. So we'll consider first that case. And so we get this uh, contribution to the Casimir energy. So it's 1 over L. And then Q uh, has, comes from the fact that we have Q fermions. We have uh, this large number of fermions. And um, in addition, uh, we have a piece that comes from the conformal anomaly here, because this is a warp two dimension warp space. Um, and this just changes the numerical factor, but we still get the same, the same answer here. Um, so in order to find the solution, we would uh, put in this uh, negative stress tensor source in Einstein's equations, and then uh, find the solution at least in the throat region. Okay? So that's uh, one approach, and one can do that. And equivalently, we can uh, think of it as a variational problem, where we start with that spatial slice that we pointed out in a couple of transparencies ago, which was the same for the near extremal black hole as for the extremal black hole, as for the, the global ADS2 case. Um, we found that the energy above extremality was, uh, the energy due to gravity was proportional to this quantity, uh, which uh, this was the classical energy, and then we have a Casimir energy. And then L is, uh, at this level, is a variational parameter. It's a parameter that we fix. So if we solve the Einstein's equation, we would fix it. But alternatively, we can uh, think of this as uh, configurations with various possible energies. And we can find the one with uh, least, least energy. And that, just minimizing this, gives you uh, a, a length, which is a further Q squared. Okay. Um, and that's equivalent to solving Einstein's equation. So now the throat is stabilized. So the throat is obeying Einstein equations. And the whole configuration has some negative binding energies. And the energy minus the, uh, minus the charge, uh, once you put in here at this value, goes like 1 over q, which is minus 1 over the Schwarzschild radius. So it's negative. It's less than 0. Um, but it's very small. So uh, just uh, proportional to 1 over the Schwarzschild radius. Um, so this is a wormhole that, um, so if, if you send an excitation which is bigger than this energy, you will typically will destroy this and form two separate black holes. So it's a, it will be a wormhole that can be explored with very low energy waves, but not, not the wormhole you would want to jump into. Okay. Um, so it's not safe for us, but safe for very long wavelength waves. If you, increase, if you increase the number of matter fields in the bulk, it might be safe for us too. We're not doing that for now. Um, so this is not yet a solution. Uh, if uh, these two objects would attract and fall into each other. And, but in order to make it into a, a, something that looks closer to a solution is you put the two black holes at some distance d, and now you add some rotation. So the two black holes will uh, rotate up around each other. Um, at, you put them at a distance much bigger than the intrinsic size so that uh, the Kepler formula is still valid. And uh, so they will rotate at some particular, at the usual Kepler rotation frequency. Um, now, this throat is fragile, so we must make sure not to be uh, sending in any matter uh, when we do this that could accumulate and produce a black hole. Now, of course, the rotation is implying that we have some radiation. The rotation also implies that these objects are accelerating, so there is an effective uh, unru like temperature uh, due, to, due to either, well, you can think of it from either as a, coming from the radiation or coming from the acceleration that is proportional to the angular frequency. Um, and so we need that the angular frequency is smaller than the energy gap of the throat. Um, and that energy gap of the throat is 1 over L. Uh, that's the same energy gap that uh, Xiaolang was talking about. And we need that to be, uh, we need the frequency to be smaller than this gap. Um, and so in this way, we can have a configuration which is uh, stable. Of course, the configuration will only live for some time. 
uh, until the black holes get very close together, where these uh, approximations will not be true, and well, presumably something about well, the leader merge or something. So this solution will be destroyed in that case. Um, or at least the approximations we're doing now will not be valid, but we haven't looked at that case. So we're going to imagine that the black holes are far away, and so this is a configuration that exists for some time. Uh, now, some of these issues uh, here can be avoided by going to ADS4, so you can make the whole thing rotate inside ADS4 and not emit radiation, or you can have two copies of ADS4 and put one black hole in one ADS4, another black hole in another ADS4, and then couple the two systems. That would be more similar to what Xiao Lang was talking about. Um, so we need some necessary inequalities. So we had that the length was equal to Q squared. Uh, the, we made the assumption that the distance was less than L, therefore we need that D should be less than Q squared. Uh, that's the assumption we are going to check a posteriori, so that's what we are doing right now. And also we needed that the distance, um, that the angular frequency is large enough, so that the angular frequency is small enough. That gives us that the distance should also be larger than something. And uh, fortunately the two conditions are compatible and there is a range of distances. Uh, so Q is large, so, and this power is less than 2. So there is a gap in distances where we can uh, have this uh, solution. Um, and other effects we could think of are also small, so we can allow a little bit of a small eccentricity and add the effects of electromagnetic and gravitational radiation. Of course, that implies it has a finite lifetime, but it doesn't by itself destroy the solution. Uh, so that's the final solution. From the outside, it looks like the exterior of two extreme black holes, but they are connected. There is no horizon, and it has zero entropy, and it has a small binding energy. Um, so the fact, I said that the fact that there is a rotation uh, implies that there is some, some temperature. Now, at this temperature, we have another possible configuration, which is two separate black holes that are not connected. And those would have more entropy, because uh, we will have the extremal entropy of each of the two black holes. Um, on the other hand, in the connected solution, we have less energy, because it has the kind of small binding energy, but it's relatively small. So we have large entropy versus a small binding energy. and um, the wormhole is the stable thermodynamic phase when, Q, when temperature is very tiny, but for the solution we described so far, uh, the wormhole is only metastable. It's not the more thermodynamically stable solution. Um, now you can ask uh, what happens if you start increasing the distance. So we discussed the solution when the length of the throat was bigger than the distance, much bigger than the distance. And so in that regime, the length of the throat was independent of the distance and was proportional to Q squared. And as you start increasing the distance, uh, you can solve the, the equations in a similar way as what I discussed, and you find that the length of the wormhole now starts increasing with the distance, um, and it's always bigger than the distance. So if I we draw here the, the distance line, it's always bigger, so which is good. It's compatible with the previous uh, discussion. Um, and at some point, uh, the length becomes so large that quantum fluctuations uh, inside the throat become important, and we cannot trust this classical analysis or the gravity inside, so the, the gravity inside the throat becomes quantum mechanical, and there might or might not be a solution. We haven't analyzed it uh, beyond that point. Um, so as I said, this uh, could be a solution that might exist in the well, could exist in the standard model. The standard model is the correct uh, description of nature at very short distances, and then we have a range of Qs which uh, ranges up to 10 to the 8. This range of Q comes from demanding that the distance at which we put the black holes should be less than the electroweak scale so that we can treat all fermions as being massless. Um, and if the standard model is not valid, maybe similar ingredients might be present in the true theory. Uh, so the fact that it can exist does not mean that it's easily produced by some natural or artificial process, and we haven't given any, any concrete procedure on how to produce the solution. So we have these two things that are connected through a wormhole. They are, of course, much smaller than the ones that LIGO or even the LHC can detect, um, and they are a pair of entangled black holes. Um, I, um, so now I'd like to connect this with uh, Xian Lang's talk. So we had, um, well, as I said, the total spacetime has no entropy and no horizon. And if we look at only one, there is an entanglement entropy, which is equal to the extremal black hole entropy. So the wormhole is the same as two entangled black holes. And we should think of the Hamiltonian of the system as the Hamiltonian of each of the two black holes separately and some interaction. The interaction is generated mm -hmm. by the exchange of fermions in the interior. So that interaction that Xian Lang put in by hand uh, here it's generated naturally by the fact that the two black holes are close to each other. Um, so um, 
In fact, this, this setup is very similar to a well-known uh, physical phenomenon, which is the van der Waals interaction, uh, which arises when you have two neutral atoms and they exchange photons. So the exchange of one photon generates a Hamiltonian, which is a dipole-dipole interaction between the two atoms. And it, this is valid whenever the distance is short enough so that one over the distance is uh, bigger than the different energy levels you have in the atom, so that this uh, dipole has, uh, well, can act on various states. And what this interaction does is entangle the two atoms and generates a force. And this is the force that apparently gives, allows gigos to walk on walls. Okay. Um, now, the, in the case of the two black holes, it's the same. So we have the, all the states of the two black holes. Instead of exchanging photons, we're exchanging fermions. And we're generating an interaction, which is uh, of the two fermion form, uh, identical to the one that we saw in the previous talk. Um, so in conclusions, we display the solution of Einstein's Maxwell theory with charged fermions. It's a traversal wormhole in four dimensions. We know exotic matter. Uh, in fact, it could even be the standard model matter. And it balances quant classical and quantum effects. Uh, it has a non-trivial space-time topology, which is forbidden in the classical theory. Mm. It's allowed in the quantum theory. Um, it does not violate causality. And it has no horizon and no entropy. And it can be viewed as a pair of entangled black holes. A couple of questions for the future. One is that if we start from disconnected black holes, how quickly can they connect and form the solutions? And under what circumstances can you uh, produce this? It should be something difficult because uh, it involves a topology change. And so it would be interesting to see whether that can to, to bound in some way how quickly you can do it. And if you manage to be able to, to understand that it can be done fast enough, then maybe we can turn into, into a prediction from quantum gravity. Maybe from general quantum principles, you can say that it should happen fast enough, and then it's a prediction for our description of quantum black holes. Thank you. OK. Uh, thanks for the inspiring talk. So now it's open to questions. Sorry, Juan. I didn't understand one thing. If you sent in a pulse of yeah. wavelength of order the Schwarzschild radius so yes. it doesn't unbind the system, yeah. uh, will it go down and form a black hole in the interior? Well, if the energy of this pulse is smaller than uh, 1 over the Schwarzschild radius, it just goes into one mouth and goes out the other. It if doesn't form a black hole. No, no, no it, just, it just goes into one and goes, into, goes out the other, the other mouth. Okay. Well, question. And so uh, you said that uh, uh, the wave which is sent in must be larger than uh, Schwarzschild radius. Yes, in yes, order to, yes, yes. But then in what sense you can operationally check that this is transversal warm form without well, any... Well, it's, it's any traversable distance. for this wave. So for this wave can go... Yeah, so, so if but, you send a wave into uh, an ordinary black hole, uh, it will not come out immediately. So, well, or at least even yeah. after this delay. It will just go in and, well, then you know, radiation will come out or whatever. Yeah. But here, uh, the wave goes into one, and then after a while, it comes out on the other side. So in other words, uh, perhaps more clearly, uh, this is a system that has an energy gap, as, go, as opposed to the black hole, which uh, has a very tiny gap. So this is, it has a finite energy gap of order 1 over q squared. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 it's yeah. marginal. Is that true? Because the wavelengths have to be kind of smaller or around the Schwarzschild radius. No, no. I mean, it's a clear sense in which it's a wormhole in the sense that the waves, I mean, you can explore a geometry with waves, and when you explore it with waves, it's a, it's a worm. Okay. Uh, way back there. Oh. Um, is there a metric for your solution? Yes, yes. So there is a metric, and uh, it's a concrete metric that is produced by patches, and uh, we describe the solution by using various approximations. Okay, so, we may have. Yeah. Okay, we may have just two more questions, maybe. Here. It seems to me that maybe the version with two ADS fours wouldn't work because you wouldn't have closed magnetic field lines to give the negative Casimir energy. Yeah, so, so the version with two ADS4s, uh, you would have to somehow um, also couple the fermions across the two, two ADS4s. So you'd have to couple the boundaries of the Yes, yes, yes. So it would be very similar to the, to the, um, to the setup that Xiaolang described. Okay. Maybe the last question. Okay. Oh, over there, yes.
uh, by integrating out your massless fermions, yeah. uh, you presumably get some new classical effective equation, some maybe non-local classical effective equation that modifies Einstein's equations, for which your new thing is a solution. And uh, I was wondering whether you might find classical solutions in this new classical equation that you know, just classically formed the wormhole. Um, well, it's tricky to, to integrate out the fermions because they are massless. So, uh, it would be non-local, but same order, right? Yes, yes. In principle, you could do that. Yeah. Yeah. So that, in some sense, uh, the set, one of the equations that Xiao Lang described is doing something like this. So there was an equation where he had the Schwarzian variable on the left and on the right. Um, and then there were some correlators that came from the massless fermions uh, that gave some interaction between the two. And so that's uh, what will result from the procedure that you are describing. OK. And could you imagine some sort of collapse process that would form the wormhole? No. But I think it goes beyond this approximation. OK, so let's thank the speaker. <laughs> OK, we. We move on to the next talk, next talk by Igor Klebanov. And the title is, uh, I guess, um, Tensorial Quantum Mechanics, Tensor Quantum Mechanics at N, Large, and Small. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for, uh, for this wonderful conference and giving me an opportunity to visit the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. Actually, <clears throat> so yesterday was the first time I tasted the famous Okinawa bitter melon, which was an interesting experience. Uh, okay, so... Um, uh, so the tale of three large n limits. Uh, so there is the, the classic O-n vector uh, model, like in Wilson-Fisher, for example. Certainly has physics applications, and it's exactly solvable in any dimension. Then there is the matrix, or the 12th large n limit, where planar diagrams dominate. And this one is solvable only in special cases, like uh, C equal one matrix model or ADS CFT with high degree of supersymmetry, N equal four super N mills. And then uh, lately, uh, there is exploration of this so called tensor uh, large N limit, where tensor is of rank three and higher. And then the interactions are specially chosen to, so that everything is dominated by these so called melonic or ladder diagrams. This is the, the class of vacuum diagrams. You see, these some, uh, usually are called sunset diagrams, but in the new terminology, they're melons. They become more like uh, melons or watermelons when the phi to the four is replaced by phi to the q with uh, q much larger than four. So just to remind you uh, about matrix model, this is a somewhat non-standard matrix model where you don't assume symmetry between the indices. So there are two separate ON symmetries acting on the A and B index. And the interaction, interaction is quartic, can be represented by, uh, so the lines that transform under the first ON, we, we can represent them by red and the other one by green. So the interaction vertex looks like this. And uh, so then uh, you have, so this is a patch of the planar diagram that emerges when you take the large N limit keeping G times N fixed, uh, and as proven by Toft uh, long ago, in this case, uh, the diagram is planar, and the diagrams of spherical topology are all of order n squared, no matter how you arrange these, uh, uh, these lattices. Uh, uh, and the interesting feature is that now you have alternating green and red loops. And when you count, each loop contributes a factor of n, and then when you count them up, you get n squared. And the dual lattice is uh, square, so it can be thought of as a patch of some kind of discretized random surface. So this is all, uh, all the classic stuff, which uh, many of you heard about. But probably fewer of you heard about 
the tensor model. So the simplest one is when you take a three index general tensor, you don't assume any symmetry. And you can think of it as being in the tri-fundamental representation of three ON groups. So there are separate ONs right, acting on each of the indices. Then the propagator, uh, the propagator can be represented by, uh, by uh, this triple colored line. Uh, and it's important to choose the so-called tetrahedral interaction, uh, which actually doesn't look planar. It looks like inserting in the previous so if you look at the previous one, you have to insert some two, uh, two middle lines of another color, and they cross under each other. So it looks like this. And this, uh, you'll see in a second, can be represented by a tetrahedron. OK, so uh, the feature, if you write out the indices, each pair of fields has only one contracted index in common. That's the special feature. Then there is another interaction where they will not cross under each other then some of them will have a pair of indices in common. OK, so let, let's just play with this interaction. For example, if you look at the leading correction to the propagator, this insertion of the melon, you see that uh, there is an extra green loop, extra red loop, and extra blue loop. So you get a, an extra factor of n cube and two powers of g for the interaction. So to keep it of the same order as, as the propagator, you need to scale g squared is 1 over n cubed. So you get something very unconventional looking from the, for those who are used to the Toft limit, you have to take this g n to the 3 halves fixed and the large n limit. And all the melonic uh, graphs, uh, this terminology was invented in the paper by Bonzom, Gorauriello, and Rivasso, which I mentioned on uh, previous slides. It's just uh, you iterate this insertion uh, into the, of the melon into the propagator, then you get nested melons and so on. Okay, so it's a very interesting set of graphs. You can, for example, if you draw some simplest graphs, you can convince yourself that they have exactly the extra number of loops to contribute at order n cubed, right? So since there are n cubed degrees of freedom, for example, this graph gives n cubed times lambda squared, this one gives n cubed times lambda to the four, and so on. But this is a very small subset of graphs in 5-4 theory, right? For example, most graphs will not be melonic, like this is the, probably the simplest non-melonic graph. And you see it's sup suppressed by an extra factor of n to the minus 3 halves. So actually, none of the graphs with an odd number of vertices are melonic. That's pretty easy to, to convince yourself. Uh, I will not present the general proof of uh, uh, basically, the proof goes by erasing all the indices of, say, all the red indices, and then you have to be left with a planar graph made of the remaining uh, green and blue indices. It's a very simple proof. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so, so this is uh, uh, the field um, that has been developing sort of for a few years. Uh, but then the connection emerged with the SYK model. So the SYK model was nicely reviewed by Xiao Lang Chi just now, so I won't dwell on it, but it's basically a model with random couplings with Gaussian distribution uh, and coupling some Q fermions at a time. And let's think about just the case of Q equal 4, which is the simplest model. Uh, one can just look at the spectrum for a single random choice of JIJKL. This is from a paper by Moldesena and Stanford. And you see this nice, uh, pretty dense distribution. It doesn't have any exact symmetry. It looks sort of symmetric under reflection, like most energies are at zero. But there are no exact symmetries and no exact degeneracies, as you would expect. Uh, there is large low temperature entropy of order NSYK in this theory. Uh, and so what does this have to do with these tensor models? Well, uh, we didn't know till, till this. Uh, for me, this was a kind of turning point to see Edward Witten's paper. Uh, from the number, you see it's October 2016. And actually, I vividly remember it appeared on the evening of Halloween. Uh, so so uh, then there is another striped uh, fruit or vegetable, the pumpkin. So, uh, But some kind of pump, pumpkinic diagrams doesn't sound as nice as melonic ones. 
and it's summertime, so I'll stick with melonic. Although people generally tend, very, tend to be very confused by this term because they look more like watermelons. Uh, so, so I'll stick. I'll stick with melons, and also we're in Japan, and there is another uh, very famous melonic product in Japan called Midori. Uh, so, uh, okay, so, uh, so what, what did we, proceeding with the gardening analogy, uh, Grigory Tarnapolsky and I, uh, so, so Edward's model was not like this, but we, we pruned it to, so that model had uh, actually, uh, four species of rank three tensors, so it had four n cube fermionic degrees of freedom, and then we pruned it to just one Majorana tensor, psi ABC with n cube uh, degrees of freedom, and this looks like the minimal thing you can do to form something SYK-like. In fact, it looks like the closest counterpart, tensor counterpart to SYK. Uh, so then what do you do? You just have the anti-commutation uh, anti relations between these fermions and you form a, uh, this exactly uh, this uh, tetrahedral product of four fields, make an energy shift to make the spectrum exactly symmetric around zero. I'll show you why that works. And this model has actually exact ON cross ON cross ON symmetry of the spectrum. So you can just start constructing the spectrum. You think of these as gamma matrices in, uh, in n cube dimensions, right? Uh, in the Majorana representation. Uh, there are exact SON symmetries with these charges. And uh, generally, there will be lots and lots of degeneracies due to these symmetries. So it won't look, uh, if you just start looking at uh, the spectrum, it doesn't look at all like the SYK spectrum. Uh, just what does it have to do with tetrahedron? Well, in this case, the tetrahedron has uh, sort of two red, two green, and two blue edges. And if you look at it from the side, it just looks exactly like this vertex because the blue line crosses, uh, they cross under each other. Uh, okay, uh, so then, uh, so the connection uh, with the SYK model is that for some quantities, they have exactly the same Schwinger Dyson equations. For example, for the propagator, you can iterate these melonic insertions. You can just copy it from the papers on SYK, starting with the unpublished paper by Kitaev, and, and uh, uh, then the very nice papers where this was actually explained in detail. Uh, then you get power law correlations, right? You get like 1 over T1 minus T2 to the 1 half, which means that the scaling dimension of psi is 1 quarter. Uh, then you can look at four-point function, and then the melons actually produce kind of these uh, ladders with dressed propagators. And to find the spectrum of operators, you have to diagonalize the, the kernel. It's by now a famous technique, uh, very standard. So it's a beautiful application of the Schwinger-Dyson technique. For example, in Gross-Rosenhaus paper, uh, this was... Uh, this uh, was used using the constraint of conformal invariance on three-point functions. And uh, uh, to, to uh, cut this long story short, you can determine the scaling dimensions of operators psi, a bunch of derivative psi. You always get an equation, some function g of h is set equal to one, because this, this has to be equal to this after you integrate. And the graphical solution gives you uh, gives you a series of modes. The first one, h equal to 2, is dual to the dilaton in this dilaton gravity that Saolian just, just described. And then there is a higher series of massive modes uh, in this near ADS2 space. Okay, so what, but, but the, the tensor model, well, so with Tarnapolsky, we checked that these exact same equation works out in uh, in the ON cube tensor model, and in fact the same set of bilinear operators. But there are various other operators uh, which can be drawn. Uh, it's fun to draw them in this colorful notation where all the A-type indices are drawn with red lines uh, and so on. So you have to contract all the indices to form gauge invariant so-called single sum operators. We don't call them single trace here. Uh, and then you can draw, for example, all the six particle ones. 
they are fine in the scalar theory, but in fermionic theory, they turn out to all vanish by Fermi statistics. So the next ones in the fermionic theory will be, will be these type of uh, operators. There are 17 single sum eight particle operators, and they were drawn in a paper that I wrote uh, less than a year ago with Bulichova, Milochin, and Tarnapolsky. Uh, and these are missing, these bubble insertions, the bubbles are just ON charges that can be set to zero by gauging. If you gauge the theory, you remove them. So what is interesting about this, there are of course more operators and they exhibit very rapid growth. For, for example, there are 24 bubble free 10 particle, et cetera, et cetera. You get this large number already by 16 particle case. And uh, we counted, we wrote down some integrals that count them. Essentially, you see that the number of 2k particle operators grows asymptotically, like k factorial 2 to the k. And this means that the Hagedorn temperature of the large N theory really goes to zero. So it seems to actually, uh, so it grows a lot faster than in string theory. So the tensor models seem to lie beyond string theory. And we don't really know what their full physics is. Could they be related to M theory? Another hint is this N cube, which you see for M5 brains, but at the moment all of this is speculation. And now just uh, instead of operators, one can... So operators only make sense in the large N limit when the spectrum is very dense, right? But what about small N? So I called my talk N large and small. So at small N, you can just try to diagonalize this problem uh, and... Uh, and the, the, the problem you immediately run into is that the Hilbert space grows very fast, like 2 to the n cube over 2. You can generalize it to on1 cross on2 cross on3. And uh, eigenstates of h form irreducible representations. So the biggest case that you can do on a MATLAB is something like this. It's O4 cross O4 cross O2. Look at the degeneracies. You see, you see these huge degeneracies, right? doesn't look at all like the SOK case where you see no degeneracies in that case. The degeneracies are just for the very simple reason that there are these uh, representations of four. So a plausible thing then is to gauge the model, which is what was adv advocated in Witten's original paper on this. When you gauge the model, you truncate to very, very few states. For example, in this model, there are only four gauge singlet states. You can, uh, what's easy to gauge is the three SO groups, not O, but SO. And then the Z2s are lingering there, and I'll talk about them in a second. So the red dots just give you, this is the absolute ground state, which is a gauge singlet. It's mirror, the spectrum is exactly mirror symmetric under E to minus E, and then there are just two more states. So clearly you cannot do business with this, right? This, this, these red dots are not dense yet. So what gives us some confidence that they will be dense? Well, uh, I'll come back to this in a second. So you can, for example, for O2 cube, there are just uh, two singlet states, and they're the only two non -Z. So we drew this table with the, uh, this case. When N3 is 2, you can think of this as just a kind of matrix model, right? where you, you just form combinations psi b1 plus i psi b2, and think of this as a complex matrix, fermionic matrix. This model tends, turns out to be basically exactly solvable. And this manifests itself in the fact that all the energies are integers in some unit, right? You see only integers here in the spectrum. So that's clearly due to some special uh, thing happening for matrix models. You see the 2, 2, 2 model is very, very trivial. There is just one uh, state here, uh, ground state and its mirror, and the rest are zero energy. Here you already see these large degeneracies, but the ground state is still a singlet. So what, uh, what gives us confidence that this will become SYK-like when you increase N? Uh, so one thing is that when you look at, uh, it's possible to derive energy bound. This is uh, the more recent paper with Milochin, Popov, and Tarnapolsky, where we derived this energy bound. The energy bound correctly scales as n cube when you take this melonic limit. Or, uh, 
and the gap to the lowest non-singlet state scales as 1 over n, but the gaps in the singlet sector are, should be exponentially small. Uh, so, so you basically see energy is growing like n cubed, and inside there you pack a huge number of states. So it's plausible that they'll develop small gaps. Uh, so we develop techniques how to calculate the number of gauge singlets just by gauging the free series and, uh, and then uh, do, doing the integral over, over the, the gauge group. And uh, uh, this is just a standard technique, a kind of index calculation. And this is what it gives us. For the matrix model, the number of gauge singlets grows very slowly. Even for the case where it's O10 cross O10 cross O2, 2 to the 100 total states, right? Only 24 gauge singlets. OK, but now, uh, so you see that matrix model is not enough. It's not going to become conformal. You go to tensor, and suddenly amazing things starts to happen. You, as you go between 4 and 6, the number of gauge singlets jumps from 36 to uh, 595 million. Right? So already here, we expect really the large end, uh, the, the model to be nearly conformal. And, uh, and the, the analytic argument suggests that, uh, that there is a large because there is large low temperature entropy of order n cubed, there should be tiny, tiny gaps. Uh, but it's hard to see directly, OK? So we decided to attack this problem, O4, uh, O4 cube with 36 singlet states, which already is very, very hard to do explicitly. This is work in progress. So this is a system of 32 qubits, right? 4 cube over 2, 32 qubits. Each one is. Uh, 0 or 1, so you have 2 to the 32 states, which is really a huge number of states. Uh, and uh, we teamed up with Kirill Pakrovsky, who is a condensed matter physicist and expert on large diagonalizations, and Fyodor Popov and, and uh, Grigory Tarnopolsky are also working on this. Uh, it's a kind of needle in a haystack problem. We need to isolate the 36 states invariant under SO4 cubed out of 601 million half-filled states. In other words, those with 16 ones and 16 zeros, right? So it's, this, is, this number is just 32 choose 16. So how do we do this? It's actually, there is a simple trick. You don't diagonalize H. You diagonalize 4H over G plus some large number times the sum of Casimirs. Then all the states with non-zero Casimirs will be pushed way up. And you're left with only states with zero cosmers, which are just in the trivial representations. And the Lanchas type algorithm, where you repeatedly act on, so clearly you cannot store 601 million by 601 million matrix. But you can store the vectors, act on them repeatedly with a Hamiltonian, and you get, uh, and there is a Lanchas type algorithm that gives you both the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And Kirill, who is an expert on this, he implemented this and found 15 distinct uh, SO4 cubed invariant energy levels, uh, E equals 0 and 7 mirror pairs, E minus E. So you will notice that I advertise that there are 36 singlets, and here you see 15. So if you, obviously, 15 is not 36. And this is due to the fact that there are still even when you gauge SO4 cube, there are still some discrete symmetries. For example, if you cyclically permute the indices, namely the three gauge groups, uh, you, it's a symmetry of the Hamiltonian. So there is a Z3 subgroup, and there are also Z2 parity transformations within each uh, O4. So, so there are these parities distinguishing different states and the cyclic symmetry. Uh, we think we know what the full group is, uh, but uh, uh, still need to check a few things. But uh, what we see from preliminary numerical results is that this truncation to singlets, it does not fully remove the degeneracies, but makes them small. The maximum degeneracy at non-zero energy is three. Uh, so it's starting to, it gives you hope it's going to be like uh, SYK-like. And the lowest singlet state is non-degenerate and has the energy which is pretty close to, uh, to the bound, right? Uh, 
this, this is the lower bound we derived analytically, and this is close to it. The next states have degeneracy 3 and are still separated by sizable gap. The highest degeneracy is at E equal to 0. Uh, so, so this is the picture. We actually know all the energies, and you see there is still a sizable gap in the singlet sector. Uh, one can dream about doing it for O6 cubes somehow, like finding at least some low. And there you would expect really tiny gaps. So, so this is the sense in which this model will probably approach SYK-like. OK, so this is uh, what I wanted to say about the, the quantum mechanical Melonic case. And, uh, and now I want to, a frequent last question is, can you do anything melonic in higher dimension? So about a year ago, we made an attempt uh, uh, with John B. and Tarnopolsky to, uh, it's sort of obvious what you can try, just write down a theory uh, with scalar fields and this tetrahedral interaction, and just say this is a type of 5-4 theory. Why can't I try to declare this to be a good theory? Well, there are a couple of issues with it. One is that this potential is actually not positive definite, but let's ignore it for the moment. Just follow the nose and try to, For the matrix models, also the potential is not positive definite, but they still work in the large N limit. Now, we derived the Schwinger-Dyson equations. They were actually even seen in some much older papers uh, of this, for this type of theory. And, uh, and then when you look at the spectrum of bilinear operators, like phi box phi, or phi squared, or phi box to the n phi, it's again given by a simple condition, g of h equal to 1. And here you find a, a surprise that the very first solution is actually complex, and it's always of the form d over 2 plus i something. So what do you make of this? It means, if you think of the dual would-be ADS theory, it means that there is a bad tachyon in this theory. A bad tachyon with mass squared below the Wright and Lohner Friedman bound exactly gives you this type of complex uh, scaling dimension. And this really means that the CFT does not exist. It's a kind of formal concept, but it does not really work. And this is the case for all d less than 4, where the theory is uh, normalizable or super normalizable. So this first melonic attempt does not work. So maybe you can call this a bitter melonic theory. <laughs> but, uh, but then, more recently, uh, so we, in that paper already, we traced what the problem is, that if you form a normalizable theory with all the ON cube interactions, and there, you can derive the, uh, oops, Ooh. yeah, this is supposed to be, a, yeah, so this is actually, yeah, two, uh, one loop beta. Yeah, so the, scale, uh, the scaling dimension of phi phi, when you look at, uh, at these conditions, you find that uh, the scaling dimension is complex simply because there is no real fixed point. The, uh, the additional couplings that you needed to introduce, not of tetrahedral type, are imaginary and you get exactly reproduce this result. So, so there is no mistake in the Schwinger-Dyson. It really it has complex dimension. And just in the remaining 30 seconds, there is, uh, we're now writing up uh, what looks like a better theory. So uh, we call it stable bosonic model in 2.9 dimensions. It's work in progress with John B. Popov, Shiroman Prakash, and Tarnopolsky. Uh, on the theory dominated by the prism interaction. If you look at this, it's just a perfect square. It's like a potential of the type you get in a supersymmetric theory, uh, but without fermions. And this is the prism diagram that describes this interaction. You see that the large end limit is solvable. You introduce an auxiliary field chi and rewrite it with the help of this auxiliary field, and then play the Schwinger-Dyson game uh, actually, this theory in SYK-like language was studied by Morgan, Stanford, and Witten, but mostly in two dimensions. And we looked at it in arbitrary D, and we find that in 3 minus epsilon, actually, everything looks OK. Uh, you, you get this condition on delta phi. You can attempt 3 minus epsilon expansion, and it looks perfectly real. And for example, for 2.9, you find a numerical solution, which is near 
a perturbative dimension, everything is not bad. Then when you study the bilinear spectrum, here is a plot in 2.9, and the lower scaling dimension for phi squared is here. But when you push it to 2.8, this line will go up, and the intersection will disappear. So the two roots will merge and disappear into complex plane. So this is a typical structure of merger and annihilation of fixed points. Uh, and this happens actually for d equal to 2.8056. Uh, so while th near three dimensions it's OK, uh, uh, the theory actually starts becoming sick already for d less than 2.8 dimensions. But at least it gives you a nice toy model. And it's a wonderful playground for studying beta functions and anomalous dimensions. Uh, because, uh, so we recently did the calculation of, to make it renormalizable, you have to add seven more on cube invariant terms. So it's an eight-coupled beta functions, but with the magic of Mathematica uh, and wonderful collaborators, it became possible. So, uh, so they do have a, a non-trivial real fixed point in this case, in three dimensions, unlike the previous case. And the resulting epsilon expansions make sense for any finite n and actually reproduce exactly the Schwinger Dyson answers. So it's, if anything, it's a nice check on the methodology of Schwinger Dyson. Everything really works. Uh, and, uh, and now we are sort of exploring it some more. By the way, the, for n equal 1, this theory is just a phi 6 theory, which goes over in two dimensions to try critical Ising model. So the critical d probably decreases with n. So for some theories with small n may actually exist all the way down to two dimensions. OK, so now let me uh, so proceed with the corny jokes uh, that I was attempting. So you get, like, for d less than 2.8, you get bitter melonic theory. And between 2.8 and 3, you get Midori. <laughs> OK. <laughs> So, uh, so conclusion, the vector and matrix large n limits are certainly our friends in theoretical physics for many years. The tensor large n limits, we're only starting to explore what they can help us with. It looks like they can provide versions of SYK-like models. I'm about to be run over by a bicycle, I think. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, Yes, they, so they give you something without disorder, which is purely quantum mechanical and has some of the same physics. Uh, but, uh, but there are clearly these important differences, like this vast growth of operators and uh, zero Hagedorn temperature. So we have to figure out what's going on. Do these theories, uh, what is their bulk description? Uh, and so we, there are two projects in progress I described. One is this valiant attempt at large-scale diagonalization, which really gives us control for O4 cube. Uh, and uh, one can dream about n equals 6, where energy gap should become very small. But this is certainly not feasible in any direct sense. And then also a bosonic theory, which at least in some range of dimensions below 3, is perfectly looks perfectly stable, solvable in the large n limit and has meaningful results at small n as well. OK, thank you very much. OK, just uh, one question, OK. So I find this very intriguing um, that, as you said, it's not a ordinary, at least tree-level string theory sort of behavior with this super mm -hmm. growth. But there's another context in which we noticed you know, n to a higher power being the effective central charge or mm -hmm, of states, yeah. which is flux compactifications, where you uh -huh. get ADS, and we think the sitter with uh, radii or you know entropies that are going like flux quantum mm -hmm. numbers to a Betty number, which can mm -hmm. easily be bigger than two. And mm -hmm. you trade the fluxes for brains, you find string junction states that make up mm -hmm. you know that count. Right, right. So right. it uh, and the dual would be uh, two plus one dimensional. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if there could be a connection. Yeah, yeah. That's actually with I remember at Strings ninety six in Santa Barbara with Saitlin we just wrote a paper with this wild speculation about string junctions uh, or membrane junctions 
pair of, uh, pair of pens, M2 brains, giving N cubed for the parallel M5 brain, which actually we just wrote the paper that coincident N M5 brains have entropy growing as N cubed, so we were desperately searching for, for an explanation. And I think since then, yeah, Kim Young Lee uh, made it, uh, you know, sort of made progress on this. But yeah, well, one could try to, the dream would be to construct some three tensor theory in higher dimensions with supersymmetry that could really describe. Well, I, I don't think it needs to be three tensors part of what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, may, There's nothing right. magic about that. I think n to the... Yeah, three tensors is just the smallest thing, but it does give n cubed like m5 brains for three tensors. Maybe, so I'd like to suggest all other questions after the session. Due to the time. Yeah, we, can, we can... Okay. So let's thank the speaker mm -hmm. again. Thank you. So we move on to the last talk, last talk this session, uh, Jorge Santos. The title is uh, Connecting the Weak Gravity Conjecture to the Weak uh, Cosmic Censorship. Uh, all righty, so thank you for uh, attending my talk. So usually the speakers start by thanking the organizers. I'm not so sure if I want to do that, because every time I come to Strings, it's usually in a beautiful place, very sunny, the food is gorgeous, the apartments where we stay are luxurious, and after this, I have to return to England, <laughs> where many of these things have zero overlap uh, where I go. So, you know, thanks for that. <laughs> so I'm here today to tell you a about the possible connection between the weak gravity conjecture and the weak cosmic censorship conjecture. This will span a body of work of about um, four years. Uh, there will be many references as I go along, uh, but these will be the, my main collaborators, if you want, partners in crime for uh, what I'm going to present here today. So after talking with some of you, uh, I realized that not everybody is familiar with these GR terms, the weak gravity conjecture, the strong. Uh, sorry, the, the, the weak cosmic censorship conjecture, the, the strong cosmic censorship conjecture. It's natural that you're confused, because in GR, uh, we're not very good at giving names. I mean, the weak gravity conjecture is not even related in any way with the strong uh, gravity conjecture. So let me just, let me just give you, a, a, if you want a, a, an executive summary of what the weak gravity conjecture is. So we can go to the original work of, of Roger in 69, and basically, the weak, cas weak cosmic censorship conjecture forbids the appearance of naked singularities without cloning each other in one uh, absolute event horizon. So if you want, you want to study the following problem. You want to start with some nice initial data for the Einstein equations, evolve it forward in time, and ask whether you can form naked singularities in the future or not. So why the hell did Roger want that? Well, Roger wanted the Einstein equations to be predictable, basically. He did not want the Einstein equations to fail if you remain downside. This is a bit of a crazy statement, right? The classical uh, electrodynamics, you'll see its failure. But somehow, Roger was saying that before you see the failure of GR, somehow an horizon would have to form. This is a preposterous statement, OK? Uh, so the executive summary, is it possible to form a region of arbitrarily large curvature that is visible to a distinct observer? Now, I come from Cambridge, and if you give definitions like this, People like Mihailo the Fermas will just kill you. They're mathematicians, so they want something proper. And here is the proper definition of the weak cosmic censorship conjecture. Notice <laughs> that in Cambridge, we're good at taking definitions, but we steal from others. So this was actually uh, formulated by uh, Bob Garrosh and Horowitz in 79. So let me state this in the following way. We take a triplet, that's a Cauchy surface, the induced matrix on this Cauchy surface, the extrinsic curvature of this Cauchy surface should be geodesically complete, asymptotically flat, you want to throw in some energy conditions because you don't, don't want to go back in time and kill your own grandmother, or you have severe problems. Uh, and then uh, the question is, do you generically form uh, large curvatures? But in GR, you don't like to refer to singularities because, technically speaking, at singularities, the metric is not defined. So Bob and, and Gary found a, a very interesting way of going around this. So you formulate it in the following way. You start with some generic initial data, which is asymptotically flat. Does it remain asymptotically flat? And in particular, is scry plus complete? If it's not complete, that means that there was some singularity somewhere in the bulk. Now, in 4D, this seems to be true. People have tried very hard to violate uh, cosmic censorship, 
weak cosmic censorship, and they have not managed, okay? In asymptotic flat space times. However, in higher dimensions, this seems to be possible. So, for instance, if you take a black string, uh, there's a famous calculation by Franz Pertoris and Louis Leiner, which shows that the black string generically leads to the formation of um, naked singularities. Now, some people look at this, uh, this is not quite asymptotically flat. Well, there's a tremendous body of work that has recently uh, uh, shown up by this group, where they show that this is true even for genuinely asymptotically flat spacetimes, like the black ring. You do seem to find a violation of weak cosmic censorship somewhere in the future. Uh, word of caution, in all of these works, they only monitor the apparent horizon. The apparent horizon is foliation dependent, so even in these works, there's very good evidence, but you should take it with a grain of salt. So what are we going to do next? Well, we're going to do something that we used to do in string theory. This seems to be very hard and asymptotically flat, so let's change the rule of the games and, and try to prove something. So we're going to focus on asymptotically locally ADS spacetimes. Okay, so the next two slides should be boring for more, most of you. So what is this? So anti de Sitter is just a solution of the Einstein equations with a negative uh, cosmological constant. It is as symmetric as the space where you sit in right now. It's a maximally symmetric solution. You can use global coordinates to cover it, or you can use Poincaré-like coordinates to cover it. This, if you decide to use the global coordinates, then the boundary will just be the Einstein static universe. If you decide to use Poincaré coordinates, then the boundary, uh, where uh, the conformal boundary of the space-time, will just be flat space. So another way of saying this is that these global coordinates, you can use them to derive that ADS is conformally looks like the interior of a cylinder. Global coordinates cover all of the cylinder, and we're interested in Poincaré coordinates, which are the ones that only cover this brown shaded region here. Okay? So this is just ADS. So what is a asymptotically a locally ADS space-time? Well, ADS acts like a perfect covariant box. Okay, everything you shoot out, it will reflect to you in a finite amount of time. It has a time-like boundary, but it's such a nice box where you can decide what is the shape or the walls of this box. You can def define or choose the conformal boundary metric that you put in the walls of this box. And usually we take it to be flat. For instance, if you're interested in, uh, uh, if you're interested in uh, field theories that live in flat space, but it doesn't have to be. You could take some geometry that looks like that at the boundary. It just becomes increasingly difficult to solve the Einstein equations, but you put it on a computer and you get a result. Okay? So this is the type of space-time that you want to, to, to consider. But uh, before we do that, let me re just recall to you, remind you, what, what is the initial value problem in general relativity. It's slightly different from the one in flat space because now there's a time-like uh, conformal boundary. So the question that I would like to understand is what is the minimal data that I have to specify in this uh, time-like conformal boundary before this problem is well-posed, before the Einstein equations are well-posed. Now, this is probably obvious for most of you. The Einstein equations are quasi-linear equations, so they're second-order quasi-linear equations. They're actually hyperbolic. And so, uh, because they're second-order, you need to specify at least one free function per propagating degree of freedom at the boundary before this system is well-posed. Once you have a well-posed system in ADS, then you just formulate the weak the cosmic censorship Precisely in the same way that you've seen before, but you prescribe some boundary conditions at time like infinity. Now, note that one of the most naughty words in mathematics shows up in this conjecture. This has to be a generic statement. We know that if you consider, uh, if you want matter content which is not generic, it is possible to violate the weak cosmic censorship conjecture, but here we're insisting that we want something generic. And the idea is to start in the ground state of the theory. Okay? All the examples that I discussed or that I presented to you before, you always start with an unstable solution. It's not clear that we can form that unstable solution. But the example that I'm going to provide today, you start in the ground state of the theory, and we wish to remain in 4D. Okay? So what have we done in order to violate the weak cosmic censorship? What is the action that we've used? Well, it's, it's, it's simple, I would say. So you take Einstein gravity, here is with the Einstein Hilbert term, you couple it to some gauge field, so there's a Maxwell field, and there's a negative cosmological constant. And that's it. Now, at the boundary, we're going to fix the boundary metric to be flat. We're actually going to insist uh, on having some axial symmetry at the boundary. This is not a restriction in terms of, of a weak cosmic censorship conjecture. You can ask me about that uh, in a little bit. But it's natural to use polar coordinates if you're going to insist that at least at the boundary, you have axial symmetry. Now, you also have a gauge field, so that means that you also have to specify one of the two decays of the gauge field as you go to the boundary. 
So either specify the chemical potential at the boundary or you specify the charge density in order to be able to do the time evolution in ADS. Here we're going to dial the chemical potential at the boundary. That's the same as dialing the electric field at the boundary of ADS. Okay? So I'm going to divide this talk in two parts. In the first part, what we're going to do is to choose a given profile and find a solution in the bulk. Okay? A profile that is static and we find a solution in the bulk. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to promote this to an actual dynamical thing. So it will involve dynamics. So the first part you should regard as some sort of adiabatic approximation. Okay? This is work that I've developed with Gary, uh, Nabil, and Benson Way. There's a companion paper by Mike Blake, Aristo Menes Donis, and David Tong, which I encourage you all to read. If you want to know what the holographic dual of Friedel oscillations is, you should look at this paper. Okay, so here are a bunch of profiles that we've chosen. I'm choosing to parameterize the boundary profile with the chemical potential. This is the radial direction. Here are all of these profiles. And for all of them, we always find the same thing. There's a maximum amplitude that I can dial before the Kretschmann uh, blows up in the bulk. So I take a profile with a small amplitude. I find a static solution. If the amplitude is too large, that's it. Uh, the, the, the profile that, uh, that I find in the bulk has necessarily a singularity. Okay? And this happens for all of these profiles at different values of A. It's a bit like critical collapse, for those of you that know what that is. Good. In all cases where the solution exists, the IR is ADS4. There's a good reason for that. Power counting explained that. It's just that all of these perturbations are irrelevant. Okay? So as you go to the IR, you still recover ADS4. But there's an amplitude above which you just can't find any stationary or static solutions. Good. So if you look at these profiles, they all decay faster than 1 over r. The odd case that I've left out is the case that actually at large r goes exactly like 1 over r. So I stress that what we do in the middle to the profile is completely up to you. I just want now to look at profiles that decay at large r as exactly 1 over r. Okay? In this case, the IR geometry is changed. It's actually changed into something we know. It's a double weak rotation of a magnetically charged uh, hyperbolic black hole, for those of you that know what that is. So you know exactly what the IR uh, looks like in this case. And in this case, it's the only case where the system can actually support finite total charge. Okay? And you, this is easy to understand, why the 1 over R decay only gives this. The nice thing about this is that I can predict what is the maximum amplitude I can give to this system before I form a singularity. And you can do this analytically in this case. Okay? And it turns out to be the smallest maximum amplitude of all the profiles we've tried. And we want to do numerics. So the smaller is this amplitude, the better we are. So this is the profile that we're going to take. So this was done in 2014. This is where we stayed. You know, the boundary, we, we dial this profile at the boundary above a certain amplitude. We, we don't find a solution. And I'm depressed that it took us two years to realize that we could have conjectured something powerful, just based on these results. Okay? So what was the conjecture that we formulated in 2016? Imagine that you now promote the amplitude of these profiles, here is a class of profiles, to be a function of time. Okay? Now we're no longer in the realm of finding stationary solutions, now we're actually promoting this to be a function of time. Okay? So this is a type of function, so there's an overall uh, function which depends on time, it starts at zero, we increase it, past a max. A max is the value that we found when we did the calculation looking at stationary solutions, and we want to ask what happens as time passes by. Okay? Now I'll call this value at which we saturate the profile A infinity. So what happens first if A infinity is smaller than A max? Well, if our intuition is correct, we should recover the solutions that we've seen before. Okay? The interesting case is what happens if A infinity is bigger than A max? Well, we haven't found any static solutions, right? So you might think maybe there are other static solutions, and reasonably so. One static solution that we did find was a hovering black hole. So it turns out that you can form a hovering black hole in the middle of the Poincaré patch of ADS that is sustained by an electric force at the boundary, constructed such solutions. But actually, you cannot form these solutions dynamically, because the action that I gave you does not have charged particles. It's a bit like Rice and Nostrum. If you just have Einstein Maxwell, you cannot form Rice and Nostrum. You need charged particles in order to form them. So, based on this, we conjectured if A infinity is bigger than A max, 
the resulting bulk evolution should be such that curvatures continue to grow with time. And the solution never settles down. Okay? So this was a conjecture, 2016. Uh, in 2017, together with my PhD student, uh, Toby Crisford, we decided to test this. Okay? Now we're in the realm of solving the full nonlinear Einstein equations, full time dependence. Okay? What were our results? I'm skipping all the details on the numerics. You, you can ask me if you want, but I'm sure you don't. So here are uh, a check that we pass apples to apples. So here I have the radial direction at the boundary, and here I have the holographic stress energy tensor. If you have no idea what this is, let me just tell you, if two solutions have the same holographic energy tensor, and they're static, okay, and the same boundary metric, then they're necessarily equal in the book. Okay? So the blue points are the solutions that we've obtained by doing the static calculation before. The other squares are the result from doing the time dependence. Okay? And you see that one is on top of the other. Actually, one is slightly below, as it should, because the thing is still settling down slowly. Okay? So that's boring because A infinity was smaller than Mx. Okay, so that's, that's not so nice. What happens if A is bigger than Mx? So there's these three top curves. Here I'm plotting the absolute value of F squared evaluated at the horizon. I'm not saying event horizon, I'm saying horizon. Okay? What happens in that case? Well, for the three top curves, F squared never stops growing. And for the other curves here, it actually saturates exactly where we predicted. So if you don't believe this, let's just look at the next plot, where I have V, D, F squared, DV, the bottom two curves are going to zero. It signals that they would saturate in the previous plot, whereas the other, the other three are still growing. In fact, this one seems to saturate. This is a uh, bad choice of parameter. This almost lies exactly at the critical value, so the growth there is very similar to logarithmic, and that's why this seems to saturate. But in fact, we can do better. We can take a logarithmic derivative of F squared, evaluated at the horizon, and we see power law growth with time. Okay? We now have uh, extended this up to V of 10, and it's still very nice and flat. Okay, so this was a violation of weak cosmic censorship. I'm telling you that we're evaluating this in regions which are in causal contact with the boundary. Okay? We've checked that. We should shoot out no rays and check that these regions are in causal contact with the boundary. So, already in 2014, there was a very interesting dialogue between two very famous physicists. Okay? This occurred in, in Santa Barbara. It was a dialogue between Gary and, and Kumram. I mean, Gary's office over Venus the Pacific. It's absolutely beautiful. No wonder that he has great ideas. I, mean, he's just, I have been looking outside, see a whale passing by. It's just crazy. Okay. So, I can imagine how the dialogue went. Uh, Gary just said, yeah, let me tell you here about some results that Benson, uh, George, and I got over the last couple of weeks. Well, the first reaction of Kundrum was like, who are these guys? Why are you dealing with these people? <laughs> but okay, he, he, still, he still went along. And Gary said, we see a violation of the weak cosmic censorship using the Einstein-Maxwell uh, theory. And then Kundrum just shouts, this is very reminiscent of the weak gravity conjecture. So it just delivers this to us like in this statement. And, you know, we thought a bit about it, maybe we have to do some quantum mechanical calculation, after all, the weak gravity conjecture has to do with quantum gravity, but it turns out that the calculation that we have to do is actually purely classical, okay? And I'm going to try to convince you of that. Now, I know that most of you, if not all of you, know infinitely more about the weak gravity conjecture than I do, okay? Nevertheless, i uh, put my head inside the lion's, the lion's mouth, and I'm going to give you a, a, a small review of the weak gravity conjecture, as originally proposed. So I must say that the first time I read this, I didn't believe it. And I, I'm still a bit intrigued about it. Let's put it in a nice way. So in, in, a, in a small statement, it, uh, any consistent quantum theory of gravity with a gauge field must contain a particle with charge Q and mass M such that the charge is bigger than its mass. Okay? So th that's a statement. If this is true, uh, loop quantum gravity is dead. Okay? So we should all cheer. Yay! Okay. This is being filmed. <laughs> <laughs> My email box will be... <laughs> okay, so what is the motivation for this? Um, global symmetries are, are forbidden in quantum gravity. That's because of no hair theorem. That, that bit, so long as it's not discrete, I, I kind of buy. Uh, but that's a problem. 
Imagine that you take a gauge coupling, uh, which is very small, say 10 to the minus 100. You take a big, big, big fat black hole. Uh, it's sub-extremal. Because it's sub-extremal, its uh, charge can still be very, very large. Now imagine that this condition is not satisfied. You can lose your mass by a Hawking radiation, but you cannot lose your charge because there's no particles to carry that charge. So in the end, you're left with a bunch of remnants. Some of you might like remnants, most of us don't. So this is a problem, okay? So it wouldn't be nice if you could make these extremal black holes also evaporate their charge. Well, what are the worst possible black holes that you want to make, that, for which you would like to make evaporation happen? Those are the extremal guys, and if you put the two things together, that gives you exactly this bound. So in a nutshell, uh, it, it, it makes sure that extremal black holes are unstable to Schwinger pair production. Okay? Now, this sounds like a quantum mechanical calculation, but of course, in ADS, this is not. This is exactly the picture that is behind something called superradiance, a classical instability that happens in ADS. And the condition is exactly the same, as I will show you now. So superradiance, charged superradiance in ADS, occurs if you have a quasi-normal mode of a system which lies in this bound. Now, imagine that you have a very tiny black hole in ADS, then its quasi-normal mole frequency is approximately given by the conformal dimension of the operator that this guy is dual to. You put these two, two things together, and you get Q bigger than delta. If you take L to infinity, you get precisely what you've seen before, Q bigger than M. So this is the bound that is predicted by the weak gravity conjecture in ADS. In the sitter, I have no idea what happens. Key question. Imagine that we repeat exactly what we've done before, but now we put the charge scalar field on it. You still see a violation of the weak gravity conjecture, or not? Sorry, of the weak cosmic censorship conjecture, or not? Well, we try to do the time dependence. It's bloody hard. Okay, there's very small numbers involved. This, this will take ages. So we decide to do the adiabatic approximation first. Let's see if you can find solutions. Okay. So what is our action? Same as before, but now we include a charge scalar. Charge scalar comes with a free parameter Q, and that's the parameter that we want to compare with delta. Okay? So the question is, are there non-singular stationary solutions with scalar hair for arbitrarily large amplitudes? If that's the case, we shouldn't form any singularity in this case. The answer is yes. Okay? So how do we go about to find these solutions? For those of you that know how to find holographic superconductors, it's the same, okay? except that you have to deal with PDs. But that's not too bad. So you take the subcritical stationary solutions we had before, we perturb them, find the onset of the instability from these solutions. From the onset of this instability, there should be a new branch of solutions with hair. And then we follow these solutions, and we see if those exist up to arbitrarily large amplitude or not. Okay? Then you compute the quasi-normal spectrum to make sure that those guys are stable. So we've done that. Let me tell you about the results. Okay? So what do I have here? Here I have the amplitude of a given profile, and here I have four profiles. On the left-hand side, I have the minimum charge that my scalar field must have if I want to see an instability. That's the minimum charge. It's divided by the value predicted by the weak gravity conjecture, divided by delta, if you want. The endpoint of each of these curves is the maximum amplitude that I can reach for each of these profiles. The fact that each of these curves crosses this line means that you form hair before you reach the singularity, so the dominant solution will be now one with hair. Okay? So from this, it seems that the weak gravity conjecture saves you from, this, from the, the existence of this uh, maximum value. This is for one value of delta. Have you tried other values? Yes, we've tried other values of delta. And uh, this ratio is always smaller than one. So this seems that the implication goes in one way, right? The biggest surprise that we had is actually it also goes the other way. And we really don't understand. Let me make exactly the same plot, OK? Exactly the same plot. So this is Q over Q uh, predicted by the weak gravity conjecture. This is A, the amplitude. This is where the hairy solutions start. Well, it turns out that if you go to large amplitude, the hairy solutions also become singular. So you would have the same problem. But look and behold, if it's actually above QW, that's it. You can continue forever. This line, and we now have even more data, which approaches even more that line, so I can, I can show you that. So it seems that if you satisfy this bound sharply, then you can extend the amplitude up to arbitrarily large amplitudes, and you're fine. You will not see this violation. So I think this is the fact that this lies exactly at one is, is strong evidence. 
course, it's strong evidence for this scenario. Maybe there's others where this is not a caveat. Uh, we have not included hovering black holes in this calculation, so maybe even here you can be saved by forming hovering black holes. But I don't know. Conclusions, we have found a four-dimensional counterexample to the weak cosmic censorship. I think that in itself is an interesting result. Uh, if charged matter is included, we expect the weak cosmic censorship is no longer violated, precisely when the weak gravity conjecture is satisfied. Now, wouldn't it be nice if you asked me these questions? Uh, have you tried different profiles? Yes. Is axis symmetry a restriction? No, we broke it. Okay, so you've done the simulation with, without axis without excess symmetry. Outlook, what is the field theory interpretation of this phenomena? That's up to you guys. Repeat the time dependence at top, including the chart scalers. <laughs> That's probably not up to anybody because it looks very, very, very hard. Thank you. Okay, uh, questions? Okay. Uh, one detail is that the charged particle predicted by the weak gravity conjecture, at least the way it's usually stated, might not be a scalar. For example, it might be a fermion. And then you would be back with your violation of cosmic censorship. True. You should tell that to Kubram. <laughs> <laughs> question? So, oh, okay, same question. Okay. So any other question? Okay, here. Um, so I understand there are at least some ideas or progress about uh, trying to get um, counterexamples which are based on using spin instead of using charge. So uh, can you comment on that? <laughs> Thank you so much for that question. <laughs> it was one of the ones that I forgot to add. <laughs> so we've recently managed to violate weak cosmic censorship without the, 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 the electric field. Now, it seems that now there's no relation whatsoever, right? That's what it seems, because I've just managed to do that without including the the electromagnetic field. However, you know, since I came here, I've talked a lot, quite a bit with Kundram, and he's suggesting that we should add something that couples very strongly to the spin. Okay? So something uh, like, if you want that in a classical limit, would correspond to a very large, so you start with a very large number, say, of fermions, and they're so large that you can make some approximation where this looks like a neutron star, and these guys couple very strongly to the spin. So maybe, maybe that um, will, will save you from from this. I have nothing in the game. I don't know. I'll repeat the experiment and see what happens. I'll report maybe next year. Okay, so other questions? We have still some time for questions. Okay, so I do not see any more questions. Then let's thank the speaker again. And also all the speakers this morning. Okay. And the final, are there any some announcement from the organizer? No. Okay. Then we close the session and. I